In a new age world filled with delusions and wish fulfillment by morons in need of attention, renowned experiencers of high strangeness and podcasters Jeffrey Ritzman and Jeremy Vaney received invitations to a tropical paradise getaway called Paratopia. Little did they know, it was the same type of new age spiritual retreat they've been avoiding all their lives. Don't be shy. Aliens are just like us, but a little more rapey. Come on, you can shake it. Yeah. Earth is a prison planet, so don't drop the soap. Anything goes to Paratopia. <laughs> and welcome. What? No, I stand by my record of having never molested a child. Um, because that one time that I was telling you about was statutory, but um, it was for an instructional video. So it didn't really... Yeah, for an instructional video. I mean, it didn't really count. Um, I guess, you know, in the eyes of the law, it did. But I guess they don't need to know really what went on. Um, is Stanton here, or... Okay, cool. Let's um, turn on our mics and get this thing going. My mic is already on. And we're live. That's kind of awkward. Please welcome to Paratopia, the one, the only, Stanton Friedman. Good evening, gentlemen. <laughs> yes, What's thank up? you, thank you. You are widely known for MJ-12 and for, um, you know, uh, extraterrestrial hypothesis, uh, all that fun stuff. We're going to try to try to bring you to new places with this interview because I also know that you're interested in, in alien abductions. Obviously, you wrote uh, Captured, the Benny and Barney Hill book. Co-authored. Um, co-authored, please. Co-authored. I'm sorry. Yes. Co-authored. My, my bad. Um, and, you know, Jeff and I had on... Uh, a guest uh, 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 whose name I always forget, Ted Phillips. Uh, are you familiar with his work? Well, only for 30 years or so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, excellent. So, Ted Phillips, well, he said two things that struck me odd in terms of supporting the extraterrestrial hypothesis. One is that in all of his years of trace case work, um, paranormal poltergeist type activity always seems to follow. Uh, a UFO landing or sighting or what have you. And the other is that uh, after investigating the Marley Woods, he no longer finds the ETH tenable because of all of the high strangeness going on there, that it's probably more interdimensional. Um, and so I'm assuming you know all of this. And so how do you respond to that? How? Well, I'm a, I'm a little surprised at that, but I know he's been having crazy things going on in Marley Woods. Uh, I guess uh, there's no reason that strange things going on there excludes the great bulk of uh, unexplainable UFO sightings as being extraterrestrial in nature. There's more can be more than one thing going on. I mean, you know, it's a baseball player doesn't either uh, strike out or hit a home run. There are other alternatives in between. And so uh, I would be amazed, quite frankly, if an advanced civilization wasn't capable of dealing in many ways that we would have to refer as paranormal. I would expect them to be telepathic. We have many indications of that. The good ones in the case of Betty and Barney Hill, for example. Uh, I would expect that they would know about uh, biology, and I, they would know about, uh, what will I call it, uh, the life after death, the spirit world, reincarnation, all these strange things, and probably know how to make themselves uh, disappear and appear, not at the same time, <laughs> in instantly. Uh, but that still doesn't change the fact that we're dealing with manufactured craft uh, behaving in ways that we can't duplicate with the things we can 
build on this planet at least 50 or 60, 50, 40, 30 years ago. I'm sure we've been trying for a long time. If they weren't built here, they were built someplace else. If they had been built here, we would have used them in all the wars we've had. None of that excludes uh, far out, uh, paranormal, if you will. Uh, paranormal because we don't understand. I mean, uh, once it gets understood, I guess it's not paranormal anymore. So I don't talk about the ETH, and I certainly don't say all UFOs are alien spacecraft. I talk about the evidence is overwhelming that some so-called UFOs are indeed intelligently controlled extraterrestrial spacecraft. If you want to ask me, uh, are some UFOs government secret projects, I would say sure. If you want to ask, do some have an astronomical explanation? Of course. But in other words, the question I ask is not what are UFOs or are all UFOs A, B, C, or D. The question I'm asking is, are any UFOs intelligently controlled extraterrestrial spacecraft? My answer is yes. And I'd probably answer yes to several other suggested uh, explanations for some UFOs. In other words, we, we don't want to put all these into the same boat. Uh, uh, and if uh, some don't match all the characteristics, uh, you know, throw them out. Uh, that's not what I'm saying. So Ted certainly is in a good position to describe an enormous number of cases. I don't know what his latest number is, 4,000, 5,000. He keeps weeding out, so, you know, leave out the cases where they don't see the saucer, et cetera. But when you deal with the clearly manufactured objects, not just lights in the sky or on the ground, which are sitting above the ground, let's say, or almost on the ground, out in the middle of nowhere, and are able to take off vertically and land vertically without noise, without visible external engines, without any wings, without any tail, uh, you're dealing with a manufactured vehicle that we on this planet would love to be able to make. You know, that kind of flight capability is, is pretty special. So uh, that there would be a paranormal aspect, it, it struck me particularly when I was at the uh, one of the locations near where Betty and Barney Hill were, abducted. If you look where Barney was, and he's looking up at this thing and looking through the windows, and there are guys inside, and he suddenly gets this terrible feeling he's going to be captured. He manages to, to break away, and he winds up going off a primary road onto a secondary road, and from the secondary road onto a tertiary road, a dirt road, and winds up right next to a large area big enough to handle a large saucer, say, let's say 80 feet in diameter. This is a heavily wooded area, and there aren't many places like that. Now, you just can't help but get the notion that the guys upstairs were telling them what the heck to do. <laughs> and I'm sure every government would love to be able to do that, wouldn't they? You know, lay down your guns now, gentlemen, that <laughs> kind of thing mm -hmm. in your head. So... I'm not saying there aren't uh, what we would refer to as paranormal aspects of all this stuff. Uh, I think there were. And, uh, you know, what all is going on, I don't know. Why would anybody expect to know, short of having an alien there telling you what their capabilities are, and you're probably not believing half of what he says. Uh so well, actually, I agree. I agree with you. Um, you know, I, I sort of think that all of this stuff that seems supernatural now will through our own evolution, through our own, our own time, will, you know, play itself out in science. But I just wonder then, uh, next, <laughs> um, what, what's your feeling on, for instance, disclosure or, you know, alleged government uh, alien trees and that sort of thing? I mean, is that even viable in, in such a scenario where these beings um, are telepathic and know things about, you know, death life and death that we don't can do all of the well, amazing things. I think, it, things that, I, that I think it would be viable. I mean, look at what we know about the human body now. Uh, you know, whoever heard of DNA 60 years ago? The answer is nobody. Uh, the, to me, it's, it's quite extraordinary that one can take a cigarette butt that somebody had smoked uh, the cigarette and take the stuff off there so that you can find the DNA of the person and who was smoking. That's magic. That, that's not sensible. Everybody knows you can't do that 60 years ago. <laughs> uh, and there's a whole bunch of other technology. I mean, somebody, 
you'd, you'd never heard of radio, for example, and somebody pulls this thing out of his ear and you can listen to music, that's supernatural, for goodness sakes. You know, an iPod and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Uh, if you try to explain to your great-great-grandfather how television works, you'd say, well, you see, you plug it in and you turn it on. Plug what? Into what? <laughs> well, you need electricity. Well, what's electricity? You guys are crazy. You know, so what I'm trying to say is that to expect that we are the, the big shots in the neighborhood hardly seems plausible to me with our very short history compared to the lifespan of the neighborhood. And it, it's one of the things that, you know, I, I come down hard on the SETI cultists, the silly effort to investigate specialists. And one of their assumptions is that, A, aliens are sending us messages. I have no idea why. B, that we can figure out what techniques they're using. And right, that was actually my question. Uh, oh. was, you know, in, in terms of, like, for instance, the disclosure movement, where they think that it's all just going to end up being a bunch of, you know, NAFTA GATT treaties in outer space with people kind of like us. Well, it sounds like it ain't people kind of like us. And so I'm asking you, do you think any of that is viable in terms of any of these stories that we hear about alien, human, you know, handshake deals and any of that sort of stuff? Is that even possible? Well, it, it may well be that advanced civilizations not ours, which I don't consider an advanced civilization, uh, have worked out techniques for dealing with primitive societies like ours. And primitive in that we have far too much technology and not enough sociology. We spend far too much effort killing people and not enough effort feeding people. I mean, that sounds rather strange, but that's the way we are. Uh, you know, a trillion dollars this year on things military and 34,000 children die every single day of preventable disease and starvation. These people on this planet are crazy. We had a big war uh, back in the 40s, and about 38 to 45. We only killed uh, 50 million of our own kind. We destroyed 1,700 cities. Now, what good can you say about people who do that? There may be some innocence here, you know, not everybody is evil. But as a society overall, we're a primitive society. Our major activity is tribal warfare. So I don't think they send the big shots down to negotiate with us very often. I'm not saying there haven't been meetings with, say, Eisenhower uh, and possibly others. But, you know, put, give it a context. In other words, we figured out how the stars work uh, in the local neighborhood anyway. They use nuclear fusion. That's been going on for billions of years. We figured it out in 1938. How can anybody think of us as being an advanced civilization? Now, of course, it's interesting to see what we did with that. We exploded an H-bomb in 1952. Ten million tons of TNT equivalent. Three-mile-wide fireball. Oh, these are sharp cookies on this planet. They're nuts! Uh, so what I'm saying is we, we need to stand back a little bit and say, uh, there, A, there could be many different reasons for coming here. You know, graduate students doing their thesis research on the development of a primitive society. Maybe this is the only place in the neighborhood where there are a whole bunch of different languages in use. Why would that be? It's got a small planet here. Can't you all learn to speak the same language? You know, it would make life a lot simpler. You know, so I, I'm just pointing out a few things that would make anybody coming here. In other words, I don't think they came here by accident. Oh, there's a nice little blue planet. Why don't we check them out? I think they already know quite a bit about us. I think every library in the neighborhood has listed us as a, perhaps a nice place to visit, uh, but wouldn't want to live there for good <laughs> uh, They're no. evil. Uh, what, what I'm trying to say is we, we need to back away from this notion that we are splendidly advanced in our civilization, and we certainly, if we can't understand something, it's because it's not real. You know, it's not our fault. It's the fact that people have described something that's impossible. Uh, that's the title of the next book. It's going to be, It's Impossible, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> not serious. <laughs> well, Kathleen uh, Martin and I are doing another book, and it, it, what, what I'm getting at here is, we act almost as badly as the people did in, oh, 1650, I guess it was, 
who thought that the world was created in on October 22nd at 6 p.m. 4004 B.C. Uh, and so we it know it wasn't. A, well, last I heard, it wasn't. I hate to disabuse you of that notion, but <laughs> in other words, there's a big difference between 4004 B.C. and 4 billion B.C. <laughs> you know? So uh, our perception of ourself is, you know, we're the, the center of creation, the crown of creation. And, you know, I think we're about as ignorant of what's going on outside our place here uh, as, oh, I don't know, the gorillas in a nature preserve in Africa who know nothing about what's going on outside the preserve. Mm. And mm. so I, I think our egos are standing in the way here. I, I see that particularly with the SETI people, uh, the SETI cultists, as I call them, because they have all the attributes of a cult. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't be studying the universe around. That should, we, of course we should be doing that. But we also need to recognize our own shortcomings. Uh, for example, all these silly jokes about why not they land on a White House lawn. They tried in 1952, and the airplanes went up to chase them away. But the President of the United States doesn't speak for 6 billion Earthlings. He doesn't speak for 300 million Americans a lot of the time. Uh, you know, it, it, one of those silly notions, they're going to land and... It, didn't they watch the movie The Day the Earth Stood <laughs> Still? Mean, that's a more true reflection of how we behave. And mm -hmm. the, the thing that's behind a lot of this is a failure to recognize that people in power want to stay in power. That doesn't matter what the context is. The head of a company, the head of an army, the head of a government... Uh, nobody wants there to be a representative for planet Earth if he's not one of ours, except that, gee, India's got a billion people and uh, China has 1.3 billion and we got a mere 300 million. Uh, we're not going to have an election. We're not going to be democratic. Nobody will give up the power because there is nobody able to speak for us. So, I mean, obviously that begs the question. So what are these guys doing here anyway if they don't consider us equals, which they can't possibly consider us? Well, I think that they follow one of the few things I can say would apply to all civilizations. They're concerned about their own survival and security. You know any group of beings that isn't? That being the case, you keep tabs on the primitives in the neighborhood. We're one of them. You want to make sure that uh, as soon as they show signs of being able to bother you, that you're a step ahead of the game. And we did that already. The, the genie's out of the bottle. By the end of World War II, we had shown three signs that, uh-oh, uh these guys are soon going to be moving out. Soon, say, 100 years, which is nothing on a cosmic time scale. I mean, for all we know, they live hundreds of years, but that isn't the point. Uh, and why do I say that? Well, we tap the energy of the nucleus. You know, a few million times what you can get from burning coal or oil. Uh, we fired rockets, pretty good size, V2s, during the war. And we developed electronic technology. Suddenly there was radar. And the fact that the Brits had uh, developed radar systems was kept secret. And it was very convenient for them to do so, and very important because the Germans thought that the Brits didn't have radar. And uh, they got a few shocks after the war when they found out. Uh, they were working on radar, but uh, they tried to find what the Brits were doing. And I've got a story in Flying Saucers and Science. It comes from a book, um, By Any Means Necessary, by William Burroughs, B-U-R-R-O-W-S, uh, 2001. And the focus of the book is on uh, the fact that 166 American military personnel died in airplanes that were shot down by the Russians, North Koreans, or Chinese, uh, mostly right after the war, but uh, extending into the 60s. Uh, and everybody was lied to. Their families were lied to. There was nothing in the press. Uh, unfortunate accident at sea. Sorry about that. And finally, in 2001... They called the families in and told them what had happened. 
they were tickling the foreign military installations, the radar installations, so they could find out uh, frequencies, you know, and how soon they came on and all that sort of stuff. Well, if you go back a few years, just before the Second World War started, 1938, the Germans figured the Brits were developing radar. They got to be. They got these towers 200 feet high with crossbars and are lined along the English Channel with the crossbar facing toward Europe. Obviously, they're developing radar. So they sent the Graf Zeppelin, huge monster, at 70 miles an hour, loaded with electronic detection gear for the best for the day, right along parallel to all of these towers. And you know what? They didn't hear one signal. And they did it a second time. And this time they wound up over England and there was an international incident. And, oh, no, it was just a terrible storm. We were blown off course. Where have we heard that song? <laughs> 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 but uh, what had happened? They were off by a factor of 10 on the frequency that the Brits would use. Now, here are two civilizations that are a few hundred miles apart. The big technical people on both sides knew each other. They went to some of the same universities, published in the same journals. And the Germans, who were not stupid, could not correctly predict what the Brits were doing, what frequency they were using. And yet we have this crazy notion that we know what signals aliens are going to send here because <laughs> we're so smart. And I said, it's, it's nonsense. You know, it's garbage. It's phony, baloney, presumptive nonsense. Yeah. I'm not. You get the idea. Yeah. yeah, you get the idea of what I'm trying to say here. What, what, um, Stan? What one thing that um, that you mentioned up as far as the cover up goes and the, um, you know, the the thing that's always kind of set off kilter for me on that, and I'd like to know what your opinion is of this. Is that, you know, when we talk about a cover-up of the information that's out there and, and the fact that uh, that these beings, wherever they come from and all of that, uh, whatever their origin, seem to be keeping a tab on us because we're able in some way to affect them, you know. Uh, or we will or, if they give us a chance. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, first part of the question would be, uh, would there be a cover-up without the, the non-human beings or whoever they are coming here. I mean, aren't they kind of part and parcel of being elusive in and of themselves? And the other half would be, um, you know, as far as a, uh, I mean, they could blow the cover up anytime they wanted, that simple. Um, and they don't. But the other half of that is, if we're the gun pointed at the head of the universe, why would a an advanced culture come here to to, to just basically flit around and, and, and abduct people and not not come down and say, hey, Cut it out, <laughs> you know. Well, something as I would suspect. As I, I would suspect that there are rules that advanced civilizations, unlike ours, have adapted rules of behavior that help them to preserve their own civilizations. That's why I call this a primitive society whose major activity is tribal warfare. You don't survive very long if you don't learn to live at peace with your neighbors as you get more and more and more technologically advanced. Because it's that old saw, thou mayest. You can use it for evil. We did. We built an H-bomb. You didn't see us building a power plant to provide power where it's needed or excavating a... um, Oh, a canal someplace where it's needed to lead water from one place to another or setting up a big water purification plant. We use our technology to kill with. And so uh, I think they're here for their purposes, which may be much more than those I've described. For example, it wouldn't surprise me at all if they've been mining goodies from here for a long time. After all, we didn't have any use for most of the uh, rather sophisticated isotopes, elements that are here. You know, 100 years ago, you know what uranium was used for? Yellow glaze for dinner table pottery. Right. <laughs> That's illegal anymore, you understand. Sure. <laughs> but, but there are all kinds of other things here that uh, the rare earths, we, they're used in solid-state physics devices now, but they sure weren't 50 years ago. 
there may be all kinds of goodies that have been being stolen from the bottom of the ocean. The nodules, you know, mm-hmm. we don't use them. We use the ocean to store our weapons so that we can retaliate to anybody who attacks us. Not for the benefit of the people on the planet, you understand. So what I'm saying is they may have multiple reasons for coming here. Uh, and they may feel that, look, they're not doing anything nearly as bad to us as we have done to ourselves. Mm-hmm. I mean, think about it. Sure, the Betty and Barney Hill experience was not a, a pleasant experience for Betty and Barney. They were, when Dr. Simon is on record as saying he had to stop one session with each of them because the, um, I'll call it psychological terror, wow. was so great he was afraid that they wouldn't be able to handle it. Uh, and so there's no question there was distress involved as they relived the experience. On the other hand, they came back. The block was put in so they didn't recall it. Couldn't work very well for very long, but a couple of years anyway. But what I'm saying is they did their thing, and it, unlike us, we stick a knife to somebody's back or a gun to their head to get them to do what they want. These guys uh, are kind to dumb animals. They seem to be able to control our our actions uh, remotely, if you will. And, you know, call it telepathically. There's probably some other better word. I don't know what it is. but uh, So uh, I, I think there may very well be a lot going on. And, you know, we may be somebody's colony. I hate to say we might be somebody's crop. Uh, in <laughs> other words, my picture yeah. of the neighborhood includes two things that I come to uh, – different results than many people do. Uh, One of them is that I think that there may very well have been 10, 20, 50 civilizations on this planet over the last billion years about which we know nothing. Uh, Secondly, I mean, after all, there's a lot of time in there. You know, we had to dig down 75 feet to find Troy from three, 4,000 years ago. What do we know about what the place was like 50,000 years ago. We haven't dug down even 75 feet over most of the planet. And secondly, we may be somebody's colony. Maybe it's the devil's colony of, uh, you know, this corner of the galaxy. They dumped all the bad boys and girls here. (laughs) And that's why we're so nasty to each other. I don't know. They may be looking for stuff that they feel is vital to them and that we don't seem to care about. Life is pretty cheap on this planet. I mean, if you're looking to correct certain uh, genetic defects, we have a lot of them. Uh, And we're just beginning to be on the edge. You know, stem cell research may be being able to correct some of them. But you've got to pick up an awful lot of specimens if you want to find a condition that only happens one in 5,000 persons. Uh, Hemophilia is one. I happen to know a lot about that one. But uh, so who knows what they're doing here? And... I, I might, you know, you might hope that they're not here to set up a civilization to respond to an attack from the evil guys out there. You can think of all kinds of science fiction plots out of this. Sure. But what, what I'm saying is any casual look at our behavior would say uh, they haven't been bad to us. I mean, sure, look, I don't talk to the squirrels in my backyard. I don't normally shoot them. <laughs> You know, I leave them alone. They leave me alone. We have a a good relationship. (laughs) Keep them out of the attic. (laughs) Well, that's right. I mean, there there are certain rules of the game, guys, you know. But uh, (laughs) it's uh, what I'm saying is we need to look at a much bigger picture than is normally the case here. And who knows what governments know on this planet? You can understand that nobody wants to give up power. Yeah. And what if we've been given an ultimatum? Hey, you guys get your act together by 2012. How's that? Right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. We're taking bets on whether you do it or not. And if you don't, we'll take care of it for you guys. Mm. Uh, And I'm surprised that they've been so patient so far. Frankly, uh, it seems to me that we've given them plenty of good cause for (laughs) starting uh, starting again. Mm. These guys don't, don't work. (laughs) Hmm. So I I don't think upon this as one bunch of renegades. Consider the situation back, oh, from 1500 to 1600, let's say. You know, after Columbus, 
All kinds of people were coming to the New World. Were they all here for the same purpose? No. Did they speak the same language? No. Were some of them good guys and some of them bad guys? Yes. Uh, how would the natives know who was which? You know, what was going on here? Well, these guys want, anyway. Uh, and they were speaking different languages and from different places and for different reasons. So we uh, were ignorant. Hear, hear. <laughs> I don't know. The, 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 more, the more I think about the, the notion that, that they're, you know, sort of jail keepers of Earth or that sort of thing, they're keeping us quarantined because they're afraid of what we could do to them. I don't know how viable that is, only because I, I just, I look at human evolution and at least, you know, we in the Western world, the more uh, comforts we create, the more we indulge in the mental aspect of ourselves, um, the less we deal with the biological drives um, and the sort of the sort of basic necessities. Uh, those, those are sort of the things that we take for granted the more we evolve. And so I would think that a race um, that has evolved past us would not even share those concerns. Does that make sense? Well, well, I, I think they would know what the situation is on this planet. Look what's happening in Africa. Look at the slums. Uh, did you see a slum dog millionaire? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, India's got a billion people. A lot of them living just like the, what you saw in that movie. Aliens can get around and check things out, you know. <laughs> yeah, 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 but um, that's that's localized. I mean, that's not. We're not anywhere near jumping to another star system or anything like that. Right? I don't think. Well, that's where I would disagree with you. I, of course, you have to define anywhere as near, but uh, and that's one of the reasons I think there's activity now. My scenario says that at the end of uh, let's say the la the nineteenth century. It was clear that Earth was getting into technology. We had steel blast furnaces and stuff, clute in the skies with stuff. We were beginning to send out radio waves, big ships, you know, unsinkable ones like the Titanic, of course, and all that sort of stuff. But uh, And you move on forward in time, a lot more radio waves, and then you get World War II, and suddenly technology takes off like you wouldn't believe. And there were three aspects of that technology which would tell any visiting alien, uh, hey, these guys are now a threat to come our way. Uh, the three were nuclear energy. I mean, a nuclear weapon or a nuclear reactor, whatever you want to use as an example, is not just a somewhat better way of doing things than the chemicals, chemical systems that predated it. You know, during World War II, a big bomb was a 10-ton blockbuster, 10 tons. Now, our first few uh, fission weapons, 1945, uh, were between, let's say, 12 and 20,000 tons of TNT equivalent. Think of that for a minute. One bomb, 10 tons of energy, TNT. Uh, the next generation, whoops. 15,000 tons, and it took us only a very few years to get to 1952, where we the first H-bomb was exploded, 10 million tons of TNT equivalent. Mm -hmm. Now, it was a three-mile-wide fireball, incidentally. Uh, now, you stand back and look at that and say, holy cow, these guys are going to be able to build fusion propulsion systems. They understand fusion or they wouldn't have been able to build that weapon. I worked on fusion in the early 60s. Uh, it's a whole other ball game than chemical rockets. I mean, I know the academics don't know anything about it. Uh, they think we're stuck at the level of chemical rockets. Well, if they use the right stuff in a fusion rocket... And there are a lot of different fusion reactions. But if you pick the right ones that give you very energetic charged particles as opposed to neutrons, the big advantage is charged particles you can direct in a single direction with electric and magnetic fields. Neutrons are a pain in the neck because they go out in all directions. You've got to convert the energy to heat, and that's sloppy and slow. Okay. 
So if you use the right stuff in the right way, you can kick particles out the back end of a fusion rocket. And remember, we're using hydrogen and helium, which just fortunately happen to be the lightest and most abundant substances in the universe, unlike uranium, for example, which is a, one of the heaviest naturally occurring element. But if you use the right stuff, you can kick particles out the back end that have 10 million times as much energy per particle as in a chemical rocket. 10 million times. So don't tell me we're not on the threshold of going to the stars if we wanted to do it and wanted to spend the money. Now we're spending our money using fission and fusion to kill people with, but still. Uh, do you think Do you think we've already potentially done that? I mean, I know a lot of people talk about a, a secret space program and that kind of thing. Do you have any uh, well, I, I don't that? have any... I don't have any good reason to think we have, even though I was working on a program back in the early 60s. Uh, we mm -hmm. only spent, it was a big study program, nine million bucks, and it was under the direction, though, of uh, John Luce, who headed the Oak Ridge National Laboratory Fusion Program. And the civilian fusion program, uh, every 10 years we're told that within 20 years we will have fusion power. Ten years later, within 20 years we will have fusion power. <laughs> Ten years after that, within 20 years. Uh, we haven't given it much uh, push, much support. It's much easier to get money for military than it is for civilian. So what, what I'm saying is, any smart alien, and what do you suppose they thought when they saw that three-mile-wide fireball on that 1952 H-bomb? And that wasn't the biggest one. That was only 10 million tons equivalent of TNT. The Russians tested one a few years later. That was 50 million tons. I mean, it's mind-boggling. You put that in the middle of New Jersey, and you start fires from New York to Philadelphia. Now, I, I Some don't people know. People would say, "Way, <laughs> yay!" <laughs> I, I don't always think uh, of the aspect of what do I think they thought. My my thought has always been, uh, you know, if if in some twist of fate or physics uh, they exist uh, here and we can't see them, uh, or they exist in some other parallel universe to us, what what did? Happened to them when we exploded nuclear weapons. Um, I mean, that's scared. Really, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. Uh, so my question would be: I wonder how many of them we ended by exploding a nuclear bomb without even knowing they're there. Um, well, I wouldn't know about that. I obviously yeah. don't know anybody who's uh, can go in and out of uh, being here and stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. I did go to my first science fiction convention a couple of weeks ago, so I should be thinking. <laughs> it was great fun, incidentally. It surprised me. <laughs> it surprised me because there's a whole chapter in Flying Saucers and Science about uh, science fiction, science, and UFOs, in which I lambaste Isaac Asimov, Ben Bova, and Arthur C. Clarke for some of the stupid things they've said about UFOs. Uh, but the people at the convention were interested and friendly, and I gave a couple lectures, was on some panels. It was fun. So, you know, they might be thinking in terms of uh, aliens that you can't see and who can, you know, uh, show up and disappear without you knowing how or where or why. I don't rule any of that stuff out. I just don't know how to do it. But we certainly have plenty of reports uh, real vehicles uh, zipping around real airplanes, for example. Right. And, you know, what was going on at Stephenville there, Texas? Uh, I mean, I know the Air Force said, we didn't fly any F-16s. And then, uh, what was it, a couple of weeks later, oh, we had 10 of them flying. How do you lose 10 F-16s? <laughs> I, I have a question. Um, you know, we, we, we ran into this with Bruce McAbee, too, where we asked him uh, about the interdimensional question, and he said basically the same thing. He just doesn't know how to address it. Um, but if, if oh, well, it's good to hear. I respect Bruce. <laughs> yeah, I, but if if I guess the retort to that would be if, if uh, we're going to assume if we're making these leaps based on the way you know rocket fuel technology and all that sort of stuff is going, um, and we're going to extrapolate into the future that way, why can't we or why aren't we educating ourselves in the same way uh, about quantum physics leaps? Um, that might shed some light on these um Well, that's what those, questions. you know, string theorists and all those guys are looking at. Uh, I'm not much of a follower of that business. Cause but why aren't you? <laughs> that's my question. Why aren't you I not going to be followers any, of that? I, I have a, there are two reasons. One, I don't have the math to deal with it. I mean, 11-dimensional spaces is much more than I can handle. <laughs> uh, two, 
uh, I have seen no indication, and none of the people involved has claimed, that they have got experimental validation of their very elaborate theories. Mm-hmm. So I'll put it in my gray basket and say, yeah, maybe it means something, maybe it doesn't, but I do know something about the world outside that. That's why I mentioned fission. Fusion is something, after all, that every advanced civilization will know about because it's what powers their star. I mean, sure, we didn't figure it out until 1938. That tells you how, it, quote, advanced, unquote, we are. But everybody's going to ask that question. How does that big star up there produce its energy? And we were wrong. <laughs> Some Nobel Prize winners were quite wrong about that uh, 110 years ago. You know, it's uh, burning gas uh, 10 million years and not a day longer. Well, it's four and a half billion. I'm a little bit off because we didn't understand. So uh, there, I'm not saying there isn't something beyond fusion. Of course I would expect there to be. Yet let me postulate some uh, an example. Uh, when we go from a big fat atom to a tiny nucleus, you go down in size maybe 10,000, and you go up in energy 10 million. Now, that sounds crazy. I <laughs> will grant you, it gets smaller and it's got more energy. Now you're tinkering with the vitals of the universe, so to speak. So what happens when we go inside and are able to tear apart those quarks that are inside the protons and neutrons? We go down in size. Do we go up in energy again? I don't know. I'm not messing with that because that's uh, <laughs> kind of hard stuff to mess with. You know, it's not uh, home lab kind of stuff, <laughs> frankly. So uh, what I'm saying is uh, I allow for there to be a heck of a lot that we don't know anything about. And anti-gravity. I mean, I suppose you could say every rocket is an anti-gravity device and sends something upward near it's pulling it down. But we don't know how to control gravity. Uh, maybe we maybe we do, but we certainly didn't in 1947 or 57 or 67. Right. After that, well, maybe, and certainly I'm the last one to say, well, you couldn't keep any secret like that. I get a real kick out of the noisy negativists who claim secrets can't be kept for 60 years. <laughs> Balderdash. I love the Balder- Stan Friedmanisms, by the way. I'm sorry. Uh-huh. I love it when you say your your, your catchphrases. It, it turns me on. It's like, well, yeah, you know, yeah. I use them because I think people understand them. No, no, I'm being serious. I'm not being facetious either. Like, I love well, it, it, it's, it's one of those things that I try to do because I give so many lectures and to such a wide variety of audiences. You know, a science fiction convention, uh, uh what do you call them, uh, military groups I've talked to, uh, management clubs from Lockheed and uh, McDonnell Douglas and North American Rockwell, groups like that. Uh, so I've got to vary my style and try to, and also I, the standard, I've talked to sixth graders, for goodness sakes. So if you want to communicate, it isn't enough for me to talk. They've got to understand what I'm saying. Otherwise, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. They may be polite and not say anything, but <laughs> I mean, they've understood me. <laughs> Have you seen more or less or equal interest in this from um, the corporate and, and military entities you just you just said that you've spoken in front of uh, over the years? Well, uh, it, it's hard to judge that. I, I, look, back in 1969... I spoke to 2,000 people at East Carolina State University. They had a whole series of lectures, and mine was the best attendant. The uh, local, uh, what do you call it, Uh, the people who look after things in the town, Chamber of Commerce, I guess is what they were, Uh, they sponsored this whole series. And that was back then. And I frequently get the biggest crowds they've had on campus. And it's not me, but professional scientist talks about a subject that people are afraid to talk about, generally speaking. And you know, you're not afraid to show up at the local university. I mean, I may turn out to be a nut, but you can't blame them for, <laughs> for coming because, after all, they worked for GE, Westinghouse, et cetera. But uh, I, I will say this, that uh, the press attitude is changing a little bit now. The big problem in ufology is that the two groups who should be doing the most good, the scientific community and the journalistic community, 
have failed. They're not only not doing the most good, they're doing the most harm by making all kinds of nasty, noisy, negativist comments about things. And it's not just the SETI people. And I think the biggest reason, I, I just wrote a column, I don't think it's appeared yet in UFO Magazine or the MUFON Journal, in which I go through this, that they can't admit how ignorant we are, how close to the bottom of the hill we are instead of at the top. It's a tremendously humbling experience to look back a hundred years and see how little we knew and see how much things have changed. And they want to think that we're at the end of the change. We're at the top of the heap. And every generation has been like that. Well, that's just the thing, yeah. I mean, every generation takes for granted what they know and thinks that that's the end of it. Yeah. All we got to do is move the decimal point, you know, make things a little more accurate. And that's balderdash. Every generation comes along and shows that the guys before them were wrong. Uh, Sure. And incidentally, that does remind me, one of my pet peeves is that people claim, I mean, I'm pro Roswell. I'm the original civilian investigator. I believe we did recover an alien spacecraft, et cetera, et cetera. But to suggest that the only reason we have advanced technology is we back-engineered it from crashed saucers, I think is absurd. And the biggest reason being, look at the amounts of money that have been poured into advanced research and development. We're not talking about uh, a few professors here and a few grad students there. We're talking about major amounts of money. Uh, just a trivial example by comparison, when I was working on nuclear airplanes, 1958, General Electric Aircraft Nuclear Propulsion Department. That's what it said on the door. Uh, we employed 3,500 people. 1,100 of them were engineers and scientists, and that year we spent $100 million. That was a lot of money in 1958. I guess it's a lot of money now, but still. Uh, you know, there have been all kinds of large programs conducted and in which secrecy was a part. Now, our program was itself not a black program, but look at this. The stealth fighter, uh, $10 billion in 10 years, spent not at a university, but at Lockheed. Mm -hmm. All kinds of, the NRO has put up satellites that cost half a billion dollars. A single satellite. I mean, it's complicated as heck, you know, but still. uh, So we have spent an enormous amount of money, a lot of manpower, a lot of brain power, whatever, however you want to slice it. And I can't give the aliens all that credit. I don't know what we've learned from Roswell and other places. One, one thing we learned, it is possible to build things that can make right angle turns, move straight up and down, move silently without being incinerated. We know that it's possible to do things, and that's the biggest step on a research and development program is knowing what you're trying to do can be accomplished. Because somebody you've already seen somebody else do. A good example of that: the Russians knew after World War II that an atomic bomb could be built. Uh, Hitler didn't know that during the war, and so he spent most of his money on rockets. He knew they could be built, and so uh, you know I, I want to get rid of this notion that we're stupid Earthlings, and anything we've learned came from the aliens and. That's certainly not what I'm saying, even though I'm convinced that the Roswell involved an alien spacecraft. Hmm. Let me ask you a question in a whole other direction, which is getting back to abductions. Um, when you decided, well, two questions really, what was the point where you decided to include abduction testimony uh, as valid um, to this whole equation? Um, and what are your parameters for what you pay attention to in abduction testimony. Is it purely the little alien doctors come here to do little alien doctor things, or is it the whole kit and caboodle? What's what's the line you draw? Well, I, I don't know what all reasons they have for coming here. I got involved. I met Betty and Barney Hill back in 1968. Barney died in 1969. I saw Betty many times after that. And I was the first. I was asked by Coral Lorenzen of the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization if I could help this woman named Marjorie Fish, who was trying to see if she could make sense out of the star map that Betty uh, included that was in the book, The Interrupted Journey. 
So I contacted her. I was traveling a great deal and visited her. I was with her. She was in Ohio at the time. I was with her when she made her presentation in Chicago to J. Allen Hynek. Dave Saunders was there. Uh, I was the first to publish an article about that work with uh, Bobby Ansley Gironda in Saga Magazine. And I was probably on the Internet somewhere. I hadn't thought about that before. <laughs> um, and I was the one who instigated Terry Dickinson's article in Astronomy Magazine. And it was a combination of all those things, having met the people, having talked to Simon, having heard some of the tapes, I've heard more since, or read the transcription of several more, that convinced me that, indeed, some people are being abducted. Does that mean I think everybody who makes such a claim is telling the truth? Of course it doesn't mean that. And, you know, it was frustrating at first. Dr. Simon, the psychiatrist who did the hip who did the hypnosis with Betty and Barney, certainly wasn't trying to convince them that they had been abducted. Quite the reverse. He did all in his power to convince, try to convince Barney that, oh, he was just uh, repeating Betty's dreams uh, about that were an abduction scenario, if you will. And, you know, we worry about uh, hypnotists putting thoughts in the minds of their, their subjects. Well, in this case, these were negative thoughts, you know, mm-hmm. and he still didn't succeed in that. Uh, so each case must be taken on its own merits, and I'm sure Ted Phillips will tell you the same thing. Uh, there's a lot of similarity between a lot of cases, but there are differences, too. And so I consider the abduction scenario an important aspect of the problem, I don't know what the heck is going on. I did ask a woman who was a Canadian abductee. I live in Canada. Uh, I do have a post office box in beautiful downtown Holton, Maine, and it's on my website, www.stantonfriedman.com. But I asked this woman, uh, an abductee, and I asked her, did you get any sense of why you? That's a common earthling question, isn't it? Why did they pick me? And she apparently had a meeting with somebody who looked more or less like us, but supposedly worked with the aliens. And she said the only answer she got to that question was, it was easy to pick up on me, to tell where I was and stuff. So, you know, you you put your your sensors out and you're listening for signals. And I've often wondered, and I should look it up sometime, what the first response was to the notion that you got electromagnetic signals from people's heads. How could you? There's no batteries there. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, but you do, as a matter of fact. So it may be, and, you know, you can now buy these little things that are smaller than a BB that you can put in animals or people and that have a little transmitter in them, and if you wave a wand at them of the right kind, you can get a signal back that identifies that cow or dog or person. That sounds pretty far out, but it's true. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it may be that they pick us on a random basis. We do a lot of random sampling. Uh, Gallup polls and stuff like that. It's random sampling, isn't it? So the abduction phenomena I find fascinating. And whether it involves uh, hybridization or not, I don't know. Certainly with Betty and Barney, they apparently took sperm from Barney in a mechanical sort of way, and they were checking Betty, who, as it happens, was uh, sterile. Uh, And so, you know, they might have said, well, we can't go any farther with these guys. (laughs) Uh, so I don't know what's going on there. You know, I wonder what uh, the, uh, who was it, Jane, uh, who studied the uh, gorillas? Uh, Jane Goodall. Jane Goodall, yeah. I wonder what the gor- uh, gorillas said to each other about this this strange creature that's been lurking around all this time. Seems <laughs> to be safe, doesn't do anything bad to them, but what do you suppose she's doing here? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder oh. if anybody's ever written a story like that. <laughs> That'd be good. Not a, not a bad idea. I, I, <laughs> got a, I got a question that kind of speaks to your longevity in this field because I, I've, been, I've seen you in TV and film about the subject since I was a little kid. So you've seen uh, a lot of time. I'm sorry. <laughs> he meant since and you I, were a little kid. 
and I'm 42. Uh, uh, well, I'm 74. So you, Sorry. Well, there you go. <laughs> um, but you've seen a lot of things kind of come and go in this. And yeah. uh, I'm curious. Uh, I mean, I, I think if you, if any, anyone listening to this show pretty much knows that we're not big fans of people like Stephen Greer and uh, Billy Meyer and people like that. Uh, but those people often kind of seem to come and go sometimes. Do you see a bigger influx these days of the nonsense, the garbage, the, um, or has it pretty much remained consistent across the years that you've been involved? Or, or do you see no, more of it? I would, I would have to say that I think there's more nonsense today, and I'd blame it on the Internet. Hmm. Uh, uh, you know, I, I I had a call once from somebody who said he wanted, he liked my research and wondered if I could make a comment or two about uh, how important the Internet was to my research. And I said, well, it really isn't very important. I mean, yeah, I like to be able to respond to a letter without, you know, typing an envelope and right. putting a stamp on it, and I can get an instant response. And if I have a question like who won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1958, I can go to my computer, you know, in 30 seconds I get an answer, and the university library is, uh, takes me at least 10 minutes to get the car out and go and park and go inside and stuff like that. So that's all great, but I shocked him by saying, as far as my research was concerned, uh, very little of it involved the Internet. What do you mean? I said, well, look, I found out that Dr. Donald Menzel, for example, did classified work for the CIA and 30 different companies and so forth, when nobody knew that. How did I find out? I had to get permission from three different people to look at his files at Harvard. None of that stuff was scanned. Right. Uh, you can't go to the uh, Eisenhower Library and say, give me everything you got in your computer on MJ-12, and they'll tell you, our stuff isn't on the computer. So... Uh, what I find is that there are too darn many people who say what they please, knowing they can get away with it, that somebody will believe them. Yeah. Don't ask for any uh, backup as to, you know, how did you get there? Where does that come from? And that that bothers me. Also, I noticed something at the uh, Mid-South Science Fiction Con that I went to a few weeks ago in Memphis. An awful lot of young people. I don't see a lot of young people that, UFO conventions. Now, I may change my mind. I'll be in Roswell uh, in July. Uh, these are on my website, www.stantonfriedman.com. And I'll be in um, Denver for the 40th Annual Mutual UFO Network Symposium, uh, August uh, 6, 7, 8, sometime around then. And I've got several other things coming up, and maybe things will change. I don't know. But I find that uh, the use of rigor, I haven't seen a good Ph.D. thesis on UFOs in a long time. Right. So I think that uh, there's another part of this, too. Uh, when I had instigated the Unsettled Mysteries program on Ro Roswell in 1989, now, cable didn't mean much at that time, so 28 million people saw that show. And 30 million, when it was rerun, uh, a few months later, early 1990. Now, when the Peter Jennings mockumentary appeared on February 24th, 2005, <laughs> exactly. uh, it was only seen by 14 million people, hmm. which is probably a good thing <laughs> as far as I'm uh, concerned. Yeah. I have great disdain for that program. Uh, well, yeah, they treated you with a flippant backhand, didn't they? Well, uh, they interviewed me for an hour, uh, good questions at a nice museum in Roswell. It wasn't the UFO museum. It's a, it's a good art museum. And for those listening, yes, there are art museums in Roswell. Uh, and when we got finished, I knew I was in trouble. Not the, not during the interview. But after they were wrapping up, the, the guy who did the interview says, Stan, don't you think if these things were real, that half the academic scientists in the country would be working on UFO-related thesis projects? Or research projects? That was a surprising question. I said, absolutely not. Those who can do, those who can't teach, mm -hmm. which kind of caught them up a little sharply. But their bias was so obvious. I mean, how could they let an astronomer get away? This is the guy who was head of the uh, planetarium in New York, Hayden Planetarium say that our fastest craft, the Voyager spacecraft, takes 70,000 years to get to the nearest star, and scientists want to be alive when their experiments are done. 
The darn thing doesn't have a propulsion system on it. That's absurd. It's like saying you throw a bottle into the ocean, an empty bottle, and that'll tell you how fast ships can move. Or fly a kite, and that tells you how fast you can fly around the planet. I, utterly stupid thing. Now, how could they, you know, didn't anybody watch this with any good sense? So I, I was, that was disappointing. And and like I say, they only got half the attention that, that one did uh, a few years earlier. And I'm glad. Well, I think so the most I, incensed, not... you know, the most incensed I've ever been watching anything on TV was, I believe, your last Larry King appearance with Bill Nye and... Um, Bill Nye, the science guy who's purpose uh, is to deny. My God. <laughs> If I could have jumped through the TV set and choked him, I'd have done it. Uh, well, I mean, I've never heard such me. absurd stuff in my life. Well, other people have told me, Stan, it's a good thing they have guys like that on so the public will realize how empty the arguments <laughs> of the noisy negativists are. <laughs> this is true. Yes. Well, but it's not fun while you're there. I mean, no, you know, I flew all the way out to California, four time zones, yes. from beautiful downtown Fredericton, New Brunswick, uh, I spent two days of my life and didn't get paid for it, and I'm a little sick. I had somebody today suggest that uh, you're only in it for the money, Friedman, and somebody who called me said that, and I said, why do you say that? Well, I see you on all these television programs. I don't get paid for those. What? Right. What do you mean? I said, I don't get paid for them. <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> Not for Larry King either, and they don't even pay for your meals. So Ugh. it's two days of my life from here. So... And sure, I appreciate the publicity. My book went to number one on Amazon.com in three categories within a day. Wow. And, you know, that's nice. Uh, but don't tell me I'm only in it for the money, you know. Yeah. My wife would tell you I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in, in all your uh, years of research, is there anything new now? Is there any new direction or new case, anything that excites you? There. I'll be interested to see how this uh, arrangement between uh, Bob Bigelow, uh, Bigelow Aerospace, uh, among other interests that he has, and MUFON is going to work out. They're going to hire some pay people to do investigations and pay the cost to go with it and stuff. And I wonder whether that will have a major impact. Because certainly lack of money has been one of the problems in ufology. Uh, I mean, I've had a grant from Bob, oh, God, I don't know how many years ago it was, almost 20, I suppose. Uh, but certainly that's a limiting factor, you know, when who pays the freight for your time off work, who pays how you get to someplace, how about lab testing. In one case, uh, he asked, are we going to test certain paper? And I said, let me check and see what it costs. And it, cost two thousand dollars to date the ink on a piece of paper he said let's do it now it, it's kind of nice to be able to do that mm -hmm. i mean know, the question I, with him is 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 will any results ever get out to the public you know well with that i, I suppose so uh, my results did they're in a book uh that's a good question and i don't know uh yeah. i've given up trying to predict what's going to happen i'll say one thing there's certainly been a change in the public attitudes toward the government. I mean, now everybody knows governments will lie. Oh, yeah. Shocking as that might seem, I suppose, to some people. But all those weapons of mass destruction and, you know, all this sort of thing. So Max Planck, a great German physicist, once said that new ideas come to be accepted, not because their opponents come to believe in them, but because our opponents die and a new generation grows up, that's accustomed to them. Mm. And, you know, maybe that's the way we're going. And, uh, you know, Phil Class isn't here anymore. <laughs> and, right. Uh, uh, incidentally, for those who worry about such things, there's a copy of Phil's check to me for $1,000 in Flying Saucers and <laughs> Science. He challenged me about one of the MJ-12 documents, saying the typeface was wrong. It was a large pica type. It should have been the small elite type, because he had nine samples from the National Security Council, and they were all elite type. He'd pay me $100 each for every genuine such document using the same size and style 
type, and he had other conditions, uh, up to a maximum of 10, unfortunately. I'd have made a bundle if he hadn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was going to the Eisenhower Library. He'd never been there, of course. Don't bother me with the facts. My mind's made up. And I sent him 14 and an invoice, and he paid me my $1,000. And then he got madder than heck when I included it in a report that I'd published for the Fund for UFO Research. And I told him, Phil, you sent me a check. I Xeroxed it. I took it to the bank. It was good. I can do whatever I want with the Xerox. And he shut up. But it was funny because he had told all kinds of people about challenging me, but none of them about paying me. <laughs> so, wow. You can see it in my book and laugh. And a lot of times people do laugh when they see it. I mean, it just illustrates the length to which the nasty, noisy negativist will go when you consider that the Eisenhower Library is 250,000 pages of National Security Council material. To generalize from 9 to 250,000 is pretty darn foolish. Do you consider your nephew, Paul Kimball, to be a nasty, noisy negativist? Nasty, noisy negativist? Yeah, because he always seems to go after you and MJ12 every chance he gets. Well, I know. And, you know, I I think... What are those family reunions like? (laughs) Well... Look, he is my nephew. His father and my wife are brother and sister. Uh, he's a good guy, but, and he's talented. And I, he, I notice he switched to fiction movies. And maybe that means something. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we come at things from somewhat different directions. And when it comes to MJ-12 and Roswell, now, he put out a movie, Do You Believe in Magic, M-A-J-I-C, uh, Copies are available through my website, Uh And he did a nice job on the movie. And <laughs> he did get caught up short on something. He was standing behind, basically, Carl Flock, who doesn't like either Roswell or uh, MJ-12. And I insisted that he... Um, let me see what Carl had said before asking me questions, because I wanted to be able to respond to it. And uh, so he did, and I caught Carl having said something that was 100% wrong. Hmm. Uh, he said Menzel would never have said they come from Mars. That's an inside joke. Uh, he was always drawing these little figures of aliens from Mars. And fortunately, uh, the MJ-12 document says... Menzel said they weren't from Mars. Whoops, Carl, you goofed. And the same with a bunch of other things. So we come at things from different directions. Uh, Paul seems to believe that absence of evidence, like Carl, uh, uh, is evidence for absence. He went through a bunch of papers. They didn't say anything about MJ-12. Must not exist. Now, why would he expect to see anything about something very highly classified? I don't know. He, he knows better than that, but makes for a good argument. And, uh, you know, family reunions, we get to jab at each other a bit. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm not a psychiatrist. I don't try to interpret what other people are doing uh, and what their purpose, what their motivation is. You know, I get there there are liars out there, people like uh, Robert Scott Lazar and stuff. Why would he do that, people ask me. I say, I don't know. I'm, I don't understand serial killers. I don't understand uh, men who will attack three-year-old girls. I don't understand priests who will attack 10-year-old boys. You know, but it happens. That's the important thing. Whether we understand why or not is beside the point. So I don't know why there are liars out there. And I, I suppose to some extent, Paul majored in history, for example, and historians like to think they're on top of what has happened. After all, they're, they're professionals. They've taken courses. They've read a lot of books and so forth. Let me give you an example uh, that demonstrates that the, they're, they're not as sharp as they think they are, if you will. There's a book, The Wise Men, by two, uh, I think one was Time and one was Newsweek, uh, journalists. came out a number of years ago. It was looking at six important Americans involved with our relationships with Russia, say, let's say, from 1940 on. And one of them was uh, Avril Harriman, who was our ambassador over there. One of them was George Kennan, 
one of our biggest experts on uh, Soviet-American relationships and so forth. It's a big book, but a huge bibliography. Interestingly enough, there isn't one word about Operation Solarium, which just happens to have involved three different crews of people, committees, if you will, who spent more than a month each looking at a different approach to containment of the Soviet Union. And one of those groups was headed by George Kennan, and it set American policy well past the Eisenhower years. Not one word in this huge volume. It was highly classified work. When I first saw a reference to it, which didn't say what it was about, I checked with the Eisenhower Library, and they said that I don't think those will ever be declassified. The meeting took place in, like, 53, and you understand. Well, finally, by 1980, two volumes were released, and somewhat later, another volume. And they're slightly redacted, but not bad. So here we have this major effort to make sense out of the Soviet-American relationship. And the key factor in determining what that relationship would be is not even mentioned. So I'm less uh, ready to say that the, the historians know what's going on. Uh, equal problem with Dr. David Jacobs, who's a professor of history at Temple University. He's taught a course on UFOs for, I don't know, almost 40 years, I guess, 1970 on, I think 72, something like that. And David did a fine job of moderating a meeting that was financed by a rich man from Europe of Roswell witnesses, first-hand witnesses, most of whom are dead now, so it's a good thing the meeting was held. Afterwards, he said he didn't believe Roswell happened. This was not a public statement. Because hundreds of people would have had to know and would have had to keep it secret. Well, I hate to tell you, but the Manhattan Project involved as many as 60,000 people. There were thousands working on the Corona spy satellite, on the Poppy spy satellite, on an unsuccessful effort to create a new satellite uh, architecture is the fancy word that the NRO financed to the tune of $14 billion. All done in very high secrecy. Secrets can easily be kept. Not by telling everybody, of course not. Sure. Well, and they vet psychologically, you know, people for these projects, I'm sure. It's not just any old scientist who's going to be put on some, you know, super top secret project. That's true. Through. You have to be the vetted. You can keep secrets. It's, it's like not everybody can work at a missile launch site. They don't want guys who aren't stable uh, near that button. You know, and that makes sense. Uh, you know, you don't just say, hey, take the first six guys off the street and we'll make them into rocket launchers. Of course not. But what I'm saying is respectable people, history majors, uh, are under the impression that they know what's going on inside governments. And I'm trying to say often that isn't the case. Very often. I guess my last question, you mentioned Bob Lazar, and uh, yeah. that's something I've always wanted to ask you about because, um, like, just for instance, George Knapp has said that, um, you know, Bob knew things about the facility at S4 that normally people wouldn't know um, what color the walls are in the cafeteria, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when I hear things like that, um, it almost makes me lean towards that he may have been some kind of deliberate leak to postulate a, uh, a cover story that may cover up a black project of some sort. In other words, just a deterrent effort. Um, do you see any possibility of that at all, or do you think that he was strictly a, um, a, a faker for fakers? Fake site. I mean, was that just a... Well, that, that's a good question, because I have not done any psychological profile on Bob. I tried to meet him for lunch twice and he didn't show up. But uh, I have an article about him uh, on my website, www.stantonfriedman.com. I did a lot of checking on his background, because people were asking about him. Right. Uh, I'm a nuclear physicist, and he is too, they said. and So I wondered, and... 
Okay, there's no question he did work at Los Alamos, at least long enough to get in the phone book, which includes everybody that works there. Right. Worked at a Maison facility, which is not a high-security job, but everybody there has to have a clearance because who knows what you're going to run across or hear or see. Um, he uh, is not stupid. He is a very bright guy. I mean, not only the the jet-powered, the, the rocket-powered cars right. and these... And the rest of the stuff. I think he might well have been out at S4, Groom okay. Lake. And one of the things he did was work with radiation detectors. Oh. And they got plenty of them out there at the site. And so he may have been brought on to repair them, and do mm-hmm. something with them. Uh, so I'm not saying he was never near the place. I'm saying his, he's lied thoroughly about his background, and I think George has admitted that now. I mean, George and I cooperated. We disagreed, but we respect each other. Right. And so he'd tell me what high school Bob went to, and I called there. And to make a long story short, turned out he finished in the bottom third of his high school class and had one science course. Huh. Ain't no way he gets into MIT with that kind of a background. And, uh, you know, I know I was accepted at MIT. Couldn't afford to go there a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> What I'm saying is I have some uh, close connections, and I talked to five different people at MIT, including the legal counsel, about the possibility of cleaning, you know, uh, erasing his record, so to speak. Right. Uh, I also talked to people at Los Alamos and at Caltech, and uh, it, I've also looked at the Element 115 scheme, which won't work. Uh, and there are good reasons for saying that, the stuff we know something about. Right. So he has lied... Is he bright? Yes. What's his purpose in lying? I don't know. He's sold a lot of copies of the video, right. which he explains things. He made an interesting claim. Two, two claims to give you some idea. One was he named somebody who would remember him from Caltech Physics Department. And me playing detective, I found that guy. It was kind of an unusual name. And I found him through the American Physical Society. And he did have a Ph.D. and he did teach physics, but never at Caltech, only at the one school that acknowledged that Bob had gone there, Pierce Junior College in some Southern California, 2,500 miles from MIT, where he was supposedly at the very same time. And if you can go to MIT, you don't go to Pierce Junior College, quite frankly. I've spoken there, as it happened years ago. Uh, I don't think Bob was there at the time, but... Uh, uh, Secondly, he at one point said that uh, Los Alamos had 500 pounds of element 115. Well, no matter how optimistic you are about how short the half-life or how long, in quotes, the half-life is of element 115, I mean, it's probably more like a millisecond, but give them a minute, thousand, you know, 60,000 times longer. Uh, and there's no way you can accumulate 500 pounds of something that has a half-life less than a minute. Huh. I don't care who you are. <laughs> it, right. the, the laws of physics are pretty straight on that question. So he, he wasn't telling the truth. Now, is he bright? Yes. Do I think he back-engineered physics and figured out how they work with a gravity wave amplifier? Well, he was interviewed by somebody from an NPR station in Berkeley who happened to have a physicist from Stanford with him in Mufti. I mean, he didn't say who he was. Who would ask questions every once in a while? Bob couldn't answer any of the physics questions. And this uh, physicist told the interviewer, how much you want to bet he doesn't show up tomorrow? He <laughs> doesn't. Uh, have, you, uh, you know, have you ever seen the, uh, you know, I mean, his, his story is that he took John Lear and a couple other people out to uh, yeah. near, the, near yeah. the facility. Have you seen the tape of the objects that they filmed? Yes. And are they compelling at all as being... No. Uh, I mean, I get so many tapes being shown me of lights in the sky. They drive me up the wall. Isn't me that too. the most exciting thing you ever saw? Yeah. Well, frankly, no. <laughs> you know, I, I've been at John Lear's house, and I think John believes everything. Uh, he's a fine pilot. What, he's checked out in a hundred different airplanes, you know. He's an amazing like, pilot, uh, yes. Yeah, so I, I'm, you know, I'm not saying this guy's an idiot. I'm saying that he buys into a lot of stuff for no good reason. Uh, I need more evidence than he provides. And because he wants to believe somebody, that's not good enough. Put it in your gray basket, John. Right. Wait until you get more evidence. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> oh. Very good. Well, Stanton Friedman, 
thank you, thank you, thank you yes. for uh, coming on and doing a little overtime with us. Yes, very much. Okay. And don't forget the website, www.stantonfriedman.com. I mention it incidentally because you can buy my books, uh, all four of them, on Amazon or Barnes & Noble and whatever. But you won't get a autograph when you do it. when you buy them from me at my website. You do get an autograph. So, so there it is. Yeah. Buy it off the website. And we buy it off the website, get an autograph, and go see him speak. All of his speaking engagements will be on the website as well. Absolutely. Yep. Very good. Stanton Friedman, everybody. Stanton Friedman. Thank you much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dennis McKenna, and you're listening to Jeff and Jeremy on Paratopia. Eerie Radio, the endeavor for esoteric research and investigation into the enigmatic. Eerie Radio is a weekly podcast that features interviews with the world's leading paranormal researchers. Download episodes of Eerie Radio from your favorite podcatcher or directly from the show website at www.eerieradio.com. Eerie Radio. Listen. Learn. Laugh. Please welcome to the Neosphere, or the Paratopia Sphere. I don't know. What is this, a crossover thing we're doing? I don't know what we're doing. I don't know what we're doing, but basically... It's like, it's like Marvel meets DC. <laughs> yes, it is. We have, we have hijacked uh, Isoban and Eric, I don't know what your stage name is, close from uh, the Neosphere to um, to help uh, dig us out of a hole. I don't know what. To help us uh, talk about um, uh, the Stanton Friedman episode they have not heard. No. I, I don't know why they're here, but... <laughs> I know that we've interrupt them, uh, interrupted them from their average everyday lives, and uh, they're probably not glad to be here. <laughs> yeah, I, I was watching Revenge of the Nerds, fellas. Oh, well. Come on. I stand Priority. corrected. <laughs> so, Jeff, why don't you tell us what brings us all together? <laughs> I don't know. Was this my idea? Kind of. <laughs> oh. I just wanted to say hello. Oh, well, hello. Mission Hi. Hi. I get to be Iron Man now. Uh, I don't know. Um uh, well, I mean, uh, so how about that Stanton Friedman? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't he write a book or something? Good episode, I don't know. Right? <laughs> I keep hearing his name. He's quite the pesky one. Uh, yeah, he's, it, it's a couple of books, I think, book or two. I think I've got a shelf. Right. Um, like that. well, I mean, I've, uh, I've got a gray basket dedicated to him <laughs> somewhere, I think. <laughs> Quiet down, you noisy, nasty negativist. Um, uh, how about um, how about the idea that that we had Stanton Friedman on the show, and and pretty much I think all four of us are kind of resigned to the fact that uh, the UFO thing is not necessarily all nuts and bolts. That would be a good talking point. We should discuss this. <laughs> Go. <That's>... <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know that being said, I, I I love Stanton Friedman. I do too. I really. Yeah, fantastic dude. Every time I've ever seen the guy talk, uh, all you can say is is you wish more people would tackle uh, the subject as seemingly intellectually honest as Stan Friedman is. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But on the other hand, the guy needs a Jacques Vallée boot size kick in the ass. The ETH thing is just getting a little stale. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think uh, just- no disrespect to him. I love him, but yeah. I mean, I think Jeremy kind of. Uh- uh, pretty much put it to him, you know, if this is not extraterrestrial or just say, you know, it's not fitting the pattern, you know, what what about the uh, the other avenues, the dimensional angle and all these kind of things? He didn't seem, I don't know, particularly interested in that angle. He just basically focuses his, you know, his, his outlook on the whole thing is I'm not interested in that part. I'm interested in the part that could potentially be extraterrestrial. So that's kind of his, uh, I don't know, his canned answer for for that. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I think, um, which again I find ludicrous in light of the fact that you know all of these people in this these you know this ufology this ufological field uh, will study ancient history and they'll be able to debate whether or not they believe this goes back to the biblical days or mm-hmm. fairy folklore or if it all started in 1947 
or the Upanishads, you know, whatever it is. They they know what you're talking about when you mention these things. So for them to say, well, you know, I don't want to I don't want to talk about whether it's uh, interdimensional or not because I can't wrap my mind around that sort of theory is kind of mind-boggling to me. They'll they'll wrap, you know, when do you decide what the limit is on the valid uh theories that you'll you'll you know, uh banter about, you know? You know, I, I think uh, I think I'm going to play devil's advocate here uh, for a second and and say that that I, in a sense I kind of get uh, where his approach could be uh, could could be really really useful to the overall sort of question about UFOs simply from the point of view that it's good that you have a Stanton Friedman who brings such uh, such a strong scientific gravitas to the to the subject. Uh, and is capable of of approaching that sort of vector into the topic. In other words, it's almost as though you know you're sort of like okay, you know, you're left base, you've got that covered. You know, he's there, he's he's doing his thing as far as uh, the whole nuts and bolts idea. Um, and, and yeah, in in a sense, it, you sort of think, well, you know, Stanton, you you got to look at at um, this this sort of cross disciplinary approach. To all of these really weird, out there, high strangeness kind of events, and say that that it seems pretty clear that it's not simply a nuts and bolts thing. But I, I but I suppose, like I said, it's it it's good that you've got someone who not only takes that position, but is just all freaking over it. You know what I mean? It's 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 hard to imagine somebody who has a better off the cuff answer to most. Of the uh, the sort of beginning questions to UFOs and is it possible? You know, one of the first things you hear is they'll bring out somebody like uh, Michael Shermer who will explain that. And I don't know specifically; I can't think of him specifically saying this, but those sorts of skeptics that'll say, "Oh, well, we can't even travel in our stellar distances. The likelihood of this happening is just..." And so you've got Stanton to sit there and say, "Wait a second, you know, you're that's all conjecture. Yeah, that that it's impossible." Well, yeah, you know, when you put it that way, actually, that um, is is perfectly understood. Um, I, I think, yeah, if, if you were to teach a class on ufology and the possibilities, you know, aliens would be uh, sort of 101 of that, right? It would be the almost the, if you will, fundamentalist point of view <laughs> in mm -hmm. terms of right. this stuff. It's like what you can wrap your mind around and... So in that sense, um, as like someone just dipping their toe in the water, um, you know, who better than Friedman to start right. out with? Although I don't think that Friedman would want to hear that about him or his work, that, that he's that beginning no. wrong. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, let's, let's... I mean, he's the encyclopedia of the, of the you know, the, the, the past ages of ufology. I mean, he's been around for just about all of them. You know, I mean... Well, let's face it, too. He's a physicist, for Christ's sake. I mean, he's used to coming at things from a level where he can at least attempt to prove a theory, whereas if he dips into something a little more out there, that's not within his realm of, I don't want to say understanding, but at least even trying to attempt to, to you know, play along with those kinds of ideas. He's more in a, in a grounded... I'm going to try to prove this nuts and bolts kind of a thing. That's just the way he yeah, is. You, that, that's what, that's the with, background he's coming from. Right, and you got to play with the tools that you got. He's a physicist, right? You know, it's it's right. uh, it's if you got a hammer, you know, that's for a nail. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, so, uh, so, so why is he uh, interested in physics? <laughs> <laughs> It's well. I, I like this idea of sort of starting him off at like UFO 101, because then I, I've got this figured out here. You would have him teaching the beginning classes, UFOs 101. You have the uh, the upper class credits, which would be taught by Mr. Jacques Vallée mm -hmm. uh, or Vallée or however. Uh, and then you've got the graduate courses being taught by Terrence McKenna. <laughs> ah, yeah. Everybody, take a drink, please. You have to die for that third one, though. That's um, right. Well, here's something else that that I was thinking about um, that 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 doesn't make sense really. The more I think about it, uh, which is um, the, the thinking that that Friedman says, you know, possibly we're we're some sort of prison planet, and these beings um, they see what what we're capable of. You know, they they 
follow us throughout history and, and all of this. Um, and so they see where, where we're going and they don't like it, you know, that sort of thing. And then I get to thinking about, well, that makes sense if if our history has been a steady timeline of growth, but it hasn't. It's been punctuations of, um, you know, a line, a, a destruction, a line, a destruction. And that destruction can either be an ice age or it could be the fall of Rome or whatever. You know what I mean? So mm. I, I, I can't really... I, I think it's sort of now centric to say that, well, because we've had this technological spike since, uh, you know, the industrial age that, um, that they can clearly see where we're going to be. Um, no, no, they can't because, um, <sighs> well, if they do, they could, cle- they should clearly see that we're due for another ice age for one, which will set us back to, to zero or the American empire is going to fall and the world's going to restructure itself, uh, accordingly, you know, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, I think needs to be taken into account when we're talking about history and, and not just sort of treating it as this one steady climb where technology is now spiking out of control, but spiritually or emotionally where we're still chimpanzees and we can't handle it. I, I got a feeling that that, that sort of stuff uh, sort of, I don't know, I don't want to say balances itself out in the end, but um, certainly uh, you, you end up back at square one, the Tower of Babel falls and, and you pick yourself up and go on again. I think that's one of the big things that I've always had a problem with Stanton about is it's not the research that he's done or the papers he's written and all of that. I find that all pretty interesting stuff. And he is, he's a very good researcher as far as getting his facts straight and, and names and dates and all. Like I said, he's an encyclopedia. The biggest problem I got with him is kind of what you're alluding to is his whole uh, – I don't know. You, 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 you you're keeping an eye on the neighbors. You know, you don't want uh, us bringing our hostility out to where you are and this kind of thing. I mean, whenever I hear somebody saying stuff like that as a reason for this uh, or what they're doing, I always go back to the same old thing that I was told. You know, twenty years ago, you cannot possibly guess the alien mind. Uh, if even if we're dealing with something that is extraterrestrial, which I don't think we are, but if we were, you're talking about more than likely a culture that is developed completely away from us. There would be no semblance of any kind of, uh, of of thought pattern that would be familiar to us. It's like so comparing I, apples and Oldsmobiles. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the other no thing that, guessing that. that I think I said fairly poorly during the interview. Which, which is that, um, you know, the more, quote-unquote, evolved humans get, the more mental we get, the more in the mental realm we are, and the less we care about the physical. So, you know, food is, is a, a given, you know, in the industrial world. We have McDonald's and fast food. We don't kill for food. We don't um, seek out shelter. We have houses. You know, all that sort of stuff is taken for granted. Um, so we don't even deal with it on that level. I can't imagine... Uh, you know, a species that is highly evolved or whatever, e- even that those concerns computing for them, you know? So it wouldn't, I, I, don't, I don't even know that we compute that like, oh, these guys have nuclear bombs that could wipe us out. I just I just have a feeling they, they'd have figured a way around all, that a long, long time ago. <laughs> well, yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't think that we can ever guess what the, what the motive is. I'm, I'm kind of more surprised that, that somebody like Stanton doesn't take a look at the, uh, I don't know, the experience or realm a little closer to see what, what if any, meaningful communications are coming out of the experience as a whole and trying to correlate that. But, but Jeff, uh, he's, got, he's got the ETH thing down, so it's like if yeah. he's looking at that testimony, like Betty and Barney Hill. I mean, those mm-hmm. those beings told them where they come from. They showed them a star map, for fuck's sake. So it's like, right. you know, <laughs> he's going to believe that. Yeah. That makes well, sense. never trust an alien. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I mean, uh, I, I, and and truthfully, I mean, Wait, that star chart has been... From B? You know, right, sorry. <laughs> that, that star chart's been explained six ways from Sunday that, uh, um, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I've read that... that that configuration of stars could be lined up in any number of different ways, and that, by the way, would only be our directional con- of of perception of those stars, the layout of the you know, uh, of how they're set out in this star map. That's how it would look to us, you know. Well, the, the, the there you go. Of, yeah, the the number of uh, of variables that would go into 
finding any arbitrary spot in the galaxy is phenomenal. The computing power alone is uh-huh. is really really difficult to do, much less if you're you know uh, you know a, a lady in what was it the 1950s? It was the late 50s. I Betty and Barney Hill. The 60s. 60s. Um, it, you know, if, if you're, you know, someone in the 60s who had very little knowledge of, of uh, certainly weren't, you know, you're not an astrophysicist, and you glance at a map and remember it clearly enough that that you're capable of of using that, or someone is capable of using that data and triangulating a position in the galaxy. It just, yeah. it's it's extraordinarily. It, it, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but it, it really strains credulity to think that that something like that is is within the reach of of uh, you know that you just can't allow that to be any kind of evidence at all. No. No. And I, it, with with Stanton, and I'm not trying to call him arrogant, but I think it all comes back down to human arrogance again, because you know that map. If it held true, one of those beings would have had to have prepared that map standing on the face of our planet somewhere because it was from our point of view, like you said, Jeff. Yeah. And and to think that we're so ar- or we're so arrogant to think that any other species would give a damn about what we're doing, like you said, they're so technologically advanced. What what the hell would they care? You know, we're, Stanton's looking through all this through the lenses of the human being, and you just you got to take those glasses off. And yeah. you got to get out of that frame of mind, otherwise you're just going to get nowhere. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I don't, I don't say that the that the Hill case is not a good case. I think it is. I think sure. there was a lot of very interesting points about that. I just don't think the star chart was any kind of no. It's no definitive proof, proof of any kind. No. Well, but wait a but the, uh, well, let me play you know, devil's advocate for one second here, because unless you're an experiencer, how would you know uh, to step outside of yourself? and the situation and see it from a different point of view. Why would you not take it on face value that these beings came here from wherever they said they came from, showed a star map, and if it happens to be from our point of view, well, that's just so that we can understand it. That's a point. I mean, it's, uh, it's it, for me, it wasn't just the viewpoint of seeing these stars from the Earth. It was that these stars could literally be overlaid on any number of places uh, in the sky. Mm-hmm. Uh I mean, the idea that uh, I, I somewhere I had seen there were, you know, this, the stars that, certain stars that were there back in that time were not known about. And later on, they were found, and they were right. found in that spot. You're talking about a drawing a woman did from a regression uh, hypnotherapy that uh, was hand-drawn. So, I mean, are, are, we, are we to put any kind of accuracy on that? I mean, I mean yeah. I, how, how I do you calculate magnitude? You know, stellar size. I mean, any of it, because all of that becomes of extreme value. <laughs> I mean, ju- just to be able to locate a particular star, you know, you're, you're ba- having to base. Uh, you have to base the position on on everything from the sing, you know center of the galaxy to the rotational periods of of known pulsars and and. So yeah, drawing it out with a pencil, hard to do. Yeah, I mean, if it's if it's round about close to those celestial points in the sky, it could be round about just about anywhere in the sky. I mean, you could pretty much overlay that. Get get out on a clear right. night with a piece of acetate. I guarantee you'll match it up with, you know, more places than you probably have hours at night to see. Right. I mean, how many stars are we talking about involved in that map? 15, 20, something like that? Give me a drawing of 15 or 20 grains of sand, and I'll bet you if I go on the beach, I'll find that exact pattern somewhere. I mean, we're talking about a galaxy of, what, over 100 billion stars? 20 out of 100 billion? I could be... I'm sorry, go ahead, man. No, go for it. I was going to say, I could be misremembering, but... uh, Because I've I've read the... uh, I read the book Stanton did with um, Betty's niece... Uh huh. What's? Do anybody remember what's the name of that book? Uh, Fantastic. I'm yeah. sure the book is called Captured. 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 That's it. Yeah. Fantastic book. Um, but I remember the star map in particular, and I, and I do know that that Stanton really always kind of gravitated toward that as being a significant point of of research. And uh, the and looking, I remember. I do think, if 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 memory serves, that there was some way in which there was some depth. 
that was indicated. And it was, in other words, like uh, it wasn't simply a pattern of dots that there was some way of positioning. I, I could be remembering wrong, but but even so, it, it also seems as though, if I remember correctly, under two different circumstances of hypnosis, two different accounts of of that map were given, one of which she, I believe she said it was on a screen, and the other time it was something that was actually physically rolled up. Mm-hmm. Anybody recall that? There was yeah. a disc, there was an uh, incongruity there somehow. I'm sure. Huh. I'd have to look it up. But I'm pretty sure there was an incongruity between the two accounts. And again, not, not that she's making it up. But but certainly that there was some element to the experience that had some kind of a subjective overlay to it, perhaps. Uh-huh. Um, at one point, it, you know, she I, I, I remember I'm pretty sure that she was describing seeing it on a screen. And then at another point, it was something that was actually physical and rolled up. These were two different sessions, apparently. Hmm. Yeah, hmm. I mean, it's it's uh, it's an interesting case, but I, I just can't. I mean, I can't hang my hat on it. Uh, uh, there, to me, there's just. Uh, I, I mean, there's also a lot of people who say that that whole that whole scenario could have been military generated, uh, you know, diddling and uh, all of that kind of stuff because they were, you know, in that. Am I right in saying that Betty and Barney both knew a lot of people in military service in the area and mm-hmm. uh, uh, and and maybe that had something to do with it. Um, uh, the 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 area, and I've been to the very spot where their event happened, um, and and rolled around. I mean, it's an extraordinarily remote area. It's not out of the realm that something like this could happen. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I have to wonder, you know, if either of them were still alive and we could talk to them, was there anything that didn't get reported? Just like we know, other cases have high strangeness in them and do not get reported. I wonder if they had anything, maybe afterwards, maybe somewhat before. What was their history of childhood, uh, you know, possible interactions? I, I mean, we'll, we'll never know at this point, I don't figure, uh, unless the uh, the niece has been told something about, you know, an extremely bizarre situation or the, or the bizarreness of their experience up there. I don't think we'll ever know those deeper points that we all are be, would be interested in. You know, on a completely side note, but still related to that case, one thing that always bothered me about that was, as I'm sitting in front of the TV the other day watching a, one of the reruns of UFO Hunters, Bill Burns is going on and on about how, you know, Betty and Barney Hill, the first to see the greys, the first to see the greys, and he said it over and over and over again, the greys, the greys, the greys. Well, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but under her hypnosis sessions, did not Betty describe them as completely human-looking? Or relatively human looking. If I remember correctly, they weren't they weren't the the Streber. Uh, right. Right. Yeah. Uh-uh. right. They right. were, they were, she they were them as more pe- person like. And there were I believe that there were and there were two different descriptions. There was one I, I think I remember there was one little guy who was a bit more human looking and kind of mean looking and kind of unpleasant and seemed to not like her very much. And then there was uh, a sort of different shaped kind of little funny little alien who was a bit more friendly and a little bit more yeah. sort of, you know. Good cop, bad cop is, is a pretty yeah. pretty familiar theme in, in a lot of people's experiences. What does it uh, tell us, if anything, the fact that we want to make these gray? I mean, what does that mean? It's like what you just said, Bill Burns kept saying the grays, the grays, the grays. Well, it didn't look like the grays of Whitley Strieber's cover, but Whitley Strieber's cover doesn't look like a gray either. No, I mean, no. it's it's not even the color gray. <laughs> no. I don't know where we. I don't know where they get that. I, I mean, I've I've heard half a dozen people talk about uh, um, in, in person have talked about these things being gray, and I'm like, well, I don't know what you're seeing, but mine are like silly putty, uh, <laughs> you know. So well, the ones I saw I, were gray. <laughs> sort of yeah, but they, didn't, but they didn't look like the gray. You know, the, I'm, but. The, Legitimately, not like oh, that's sort of a peach color that I'm going to call gray. I mean, where did we get that association of gray? Was it from the cover of Missing well, Time, Bud Hopkins? I mean, that's after they're called? abducting people in Miami Beach, so they've gotten. <laughs> uh, nice. Well, see, there you go. The ones I saw were tan. So, I mean, three different people seeing three different colors. What do yeah. we do? Go to the UN. Yeah. 
Well, you know yeah. what's interesting? This gal befriended me on MySpace. She says uh, has her age as twenty seven. I haven't spoken to her, but oh right, her MySpace. But her MySpace page is set up like um, you know the blog is all about. I think I'm an alien abductee. And then, you know, I haven't read any of this because they're very long posts. So I think I'm an alien abductee. Here's a nightmare I had. Here's an experience I had. And her pictures are interesting because, first of all, they look like the, a five-year-old drew them. Uh, and she's like 27. And showing what her abduction experiences or flashbacks or dreams, whatever they are, uh, are. And and the aliens in them have triangle faces with big eyes um, and she says, you know, in there, look, I'm a horrible artist. This is the best I can do. So you can extrapolate, okay, it's the typical alien-shaped face, except that it ha- they, they all have antenna. <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> like the good old days of little green men with, with antenna, <laughs> you know? Well, like I a little find, alien in uh, Flintstones. <laughs> I, yeah, I, exactly. I mean, I almost want to ask her about that because I think that's fascinating if, if she really – thinks that she's seeing those beings. I mean, that is a completely perfect mix of all of the things that we've said aliens are, you know? Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, that, that plays right into, Jeff, that plays right into your idea about perception, though, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. She watched a little too much My Favorite Martian as a kid, and right. now that's her equation of... Well, My Favorite Martian alien. mixed with, with the streamer alien, you know? It, exactly. I mean, yeah. that's fascinating. And Jeff, why don't you, can you tell us uh, the thing that you told us in private conversation where you were like, you know what all the UFOs in the 50s had in common? Um, because oh, yeah. I don't know that anyone's ever said that before. <laughs> Oh, well, I've said it before. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you look at the uh, – and it, it might take some work to actually figure it out. And please don't write me for a list because I don't – I'm not doing that anymore. But um, if you take a look at – just go to ufoevidence.com and, and check out the progression of um, unknown visual photographs of saucers – or craft of any kind that you that you you look at, and you have to use a certain amount of discernment to say, okay, that looks a little too much like a, a frying pan, or that looks a little too much like an oil pan to be uh, a, some sort of alien craft. Don't count it out, but um, use your critical thought when you're looking at these photographs, and if it looks too good to be true, chances are it is. But if you look at some of the truly unknown photographs, Take a look at how it's progressed from uh, the 50s. And in the 50s, um, just like I said to these guys last night, what is the common uh, design aesthetic of the 1950s? Fins. Fins were on the cars. They were on your goddamn toasters. Uh, Most uh, of the craft photographed back in the 1950s had fins. Uh, as we progress up through, let's jump way ahead. Let's go to like Gulf Breeze, where they're seeing uh, red light UFOs. You're seeing uh, top shaped uh, craft. You're seeing um, later on in that same case, they're seeing uh, ultra sleek, uh, shining globes, chrome, multi lobed chromed craft. Uh, things that look, don't look anything like any sort of flying vehicle that we're used to. They're just extraordinarily bizarre. Um, this thing seems to almost follow a, uh, a a cultural bias as to what the design type is. Um, and this, this figured back in, I mean, I don't know if, if Eric and, and Iso know, but at one point during my uh, career with this stuff, I, I I truly did believe that this was something of a demonic nature, even though I didn't know exactly what that meant at the time. I just I later gravitated to the word toxic, which I know I've told you guys about. But one of the weird things that I always kind of puzzled over was in the cases I had in front of me, uh, some of which were not made public because the people didn't want them public. Um, a lot of the craft had uh, uh, repeated features on the structure of this object in itself. It was either seven windows, seven lights, seven markings, seven squares, or 13 windows, 13 squares, 13 fins, 13 protrusions. Um, And seven and 13 are very 
you know, demonstrable numbers for the sort of occult slash religious meaning. Seven meaning, um, you know, in, in, in the service of God, and 13 being, you know, significant as, the, you know, the rebellion against God. Um, and all of that, all of those things kind of uh, led me up to that certain point. But there are very weird similarities in the design or the perception of the design or the manifestation of these things at the specific points in time that they're seen. Uh, nowadays, we have pretty much the, the gamut. We've got discs, we've got triangles, we've got balls of uh, um, spheres, uh, of which I think, Jeremy, did I show you the sphere I shot outside? Um, no. I did, didn't I? Uh, video. Yeah, the, the the pearl shaped thing I sent you the the JPEG of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I just shot a, a, a pearl shaped one here, not more than uh, what a month, month and a half or so ago, and um, so we've got this gambit running of that. So I'd like to know, you know, what what does that mean now that we're seeing the full run of these different designs uh, or manifestations of this stuff? What does that mean looking back over time when you know, in 1950s, where they weren't seeing multi-lobed, chromed vehicles. Now, we're seeing that. What, what's the, you know, I, I, I think the majority of people out there into this stuff would say, well, that's the different races all coming here. If, if that's the case, we're in a, a goddamn intergalactic zoo. Um, and everybody's coming to the party. Um, I, I'm just not, Which, I, you I, know, I don't, as, I'm just not buying that, you know. As, as Again, sort of devil's advocate. I mean, I suppose it's possible that it just really is that many. It just seems unlikely. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, I think. I think. Moreover, I'm just not seeing the proof of that. I'm not seeing the the you know any any interaction with something else on this planet's bound to leave a trace of something. Mm-hmm. Um, and in uh, sixty plus years of modern ufology, we have nothing. Um, I think that's the hugest clue clue of all is that we we have nothing after all this time, not one shred of anything. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure that that uh, that Stan would say, well, you know, the government's confiscated all of that. That to me is just freaking impossible. With the amount of things that are being reported, the amount of things being set down on the ground, um, uh, the the amount of people having contact with something. And you're going to tell me there's no forensic way at all to, you know, to gather any sample of anything. I just, I can't, you know, I, 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 I can't subscribe to this hardcore nuts and bolts thing. Um, I think if there is proof that gets left within a home, just say Jeremy gets picked up tonight and they walk into his bedroom, um, you know, you could get a, a, a crew in there to scan the carpet for, some type of cell structure or some some sort of DNA of some sort, uh, some kind of forensic proof. The pooping that but, I had done to myself when they first arrived. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> stool sample. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, that right there, not having that says to me that either A, it's not physical, or B, it's physical when it wants to be, but when they go into that non-physical state, so does all trace of their presence here um and i you know i kind of think of that that same thing and another thing that you know david had just mentioned i was listening to the uh uh the missile thing that that they just did the show that they did with the uh ufos over nukes david that would be be uh and their show would be the paracast that's right okay um and uh you know he mentions about uh you know craft not not having a sonic boom and uh, that he he kind of postulated that these things are less solid when they're in that that state of movement of instantaneous movement, so they don't cause a sonic boom because they're not altogether solid. My answer to that would be they probably never are solid, so that's why they can move through the air and not leave a sonic boom. They're not solid to begin with. Well, here's you know? um, let me just throw this out there. I told you this. I don't think I told Eric this. I know I didn't tell Isoban. But uh, I, I should say, I should preface this by saying uh, that uh, Eric, Jeff, and I will be going to the uh, the X conference. Masahiro Kahada, who has uh, hooked me up to an EEG 
um, in the past a couple of times to read my brain is now, f- you know, officially fascinated by my brain. So he's going to bring his little machine because he wants you to have a strange brain. I have a strange brain. So he's going to bring his machine, hook me up to it again, and uh, Jeff and Eric have also agreed. So we'll have we'll have the the trifecta <laughs> of brain readings um, for that little gathering. But Masahiro is an interesting character, and I don't know what to make of him. But he told me that essentially in ninety, I believe six, uh, it was that he he believes he was contacted by interdimensional beings or hyperspace beings or something. Um, And I'll make the long story really short here. Essentially, how they communicated was to almost immerse him in a virtual reality. And he said it, you know, of course, he's incredibly Japanese, so it's hard to even understand what he's saying. But the basic gist of it is um, that they were presenting before him an illusion that he could actually interact with. So... Whatever it was that was in front of him, they, they gave him some, you know, some object in front of him. He could touch, but he said it wasn't there. It wasn't real. It was an illusion, even though he could touch it. Uh-huh. And I thought that, to me, just was a light bulb, you know? Like, to me, that's right. we're right back with Jeff Ritzman's thinking on all of this. Uh-huh. Well, there, there... well it, you, you know, I do have to say that that, that is not um, – a, a technology like that is not beyond the the scope of our own horizon, though. I mean, we we've already, I, I suppose you could say, um, uh, we've already got technologies that lead into being able to essentially fool the brain in exactly that way. So to create a virtual environment that, I mean, for instance, you know, I've always looked at uh, at if we are dealing with an extraterrestrial presence. Then I think it's safe to say that that extraterrestrial presence is is far enough of in, in advance of us that they have mastered things that that weren't even words for us a few years ago. Things like like you know uh, nanotechnology, these sorts of things. Now, if you're if you're capable of manipulating matter on that sort of a scale, uh, it would be a relatively simple th- uh, thing to devise sort of a nanomolecular device that would interrupt neurons. Uh, actually interrupt the synapses, replace uh, sensory input coming in from the skin, the nose, the eyes, and 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 replace that with a, a signal of your own. Replace that with a virtual reality. That's something that, again, is is when you when you're up on the literature, shockingly close to happening. Mm-hmm. Th- this is not this is not unreachable science fiction. So that to me, I suppose whenever you whenever we start talking about a uh, you know whatever this this experience is, whatever these beings are, and however they're they're interacting with us, uh, it's almost as though the further our own science advances, the more we realize that the line between what could be essentially the magic of of, inter, of interdimensional experience, you know, something that that simply goes beyond our three dimensional experience to understand, could just as easily be a a, a significantly advanced technology that. Uh, it is very, very possible within our, our own three-dimensional sort of sort of thinking. It's just beyond our current sort of reach. Uh, well, current reach of our, our hands, but not necessarily the reach of our minds and our eyes. So, well, see, I agree uh, with that. I, I, you know, and, and when I say, you know, I'm anti-ETH, I don't really – I'm not even talking about where they come from because I, I – all of this really – what all of this boils down to is just as a discussion of freedom – how much freedom does a quote unquote advanced race have? Do they have the freedom to go to planets? Do they have the freedom to, you know, interdimensionally hop? I mean, I, I I think that we all, all sentient beings in the universe or all universes, I think there's a commonality of being able to reach that peak of total physical freedom. Um, and so then where will we be from? Will we be aliens? Will we be interdimensional? You know, all that sort of stuff. Um, so to me, it's not even, it's not about that. I mean, I'm really, I guess what I'm sort of against is the notion that, that they are from another planet and they're just like us. And it's just a matter of shaking hands with the Star Trek idea. So it's just, it's, yeah, it's, it's just everybody, there's a federation and they have their own home planet and their own language and they have bumpy things on their nose. And it's, that's their difference between it. Yeah. Yeah. Jeremy, you pretty much made the point that I was just about to say was that the more I think about this, the more I want to look at it less from a technological point of view and look at it through, you know, the human being glasses again. 
it's it, it may not be about advanced levels of technology at all. It just may be simply what they are, period. Mm-hmm. You know, it just to be able to to do all of these things and to change our perceptions. It may not be a, a tool that they're using in a technological sense. It just may simply be something that we can can understand. That is what they are. Yeah, and I also think that that um, whether they're from another planet, again, it, there are all these things that that I think. It doesn't matter where where they're from. Ultimately, the the answer to what they're doing is the same. Like so, how do they communicate with us? Well, whether they're from another planet or they're from here, but in another dimension, I think the case is always going to be that um, the best way to communicate with us uh, is is going to be in a way that that challenges us. It's not going to be verbal necessarily. It's going to look more like you know, the hero's journey or what the Native Americans, uh, you know, sort of how they see the world in reading signs and being more visual, you know, all that sort of stuff. I think that, or even the occult, you know, I think all of those sorts of different ways that force you to use more of your senses uh, to to take in the world and to communicate, I think are the ways that they are going to communicate with us, whether they're from here or from somewhere else. Um, because I think that, that, that sort of advancement is universal. I don't know. That's just the way I sort of think about this. Well, it's kind of it's kind of like what we've all been talking about the past few days. Is that anything, any being, be it from another planet or another dimension or whatever, as as advanced as they are, would never limit themselves to something as as structured and confined as a language. You know, it would be communication on a completely different level. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because the language is our problem. It's not right. their problem. And it might, I, uh, be, it might even be that there's no choice, you know what I mean? It might be that that's just the way they communicate, or it might be completely set up to force us to, to you know, evolve or to branch out with our senses and uh, be able to meet them at that level. You know, I don't know if it's on purpose or not, but, I, you know, it's there. Well, I think we got to overcome the human perception before anything, right? I mean, uh, I, I mean, if, if people are seeing... Uh, you know, little gray, you know, silly putty tan guys walking around in their house. Is that really what they're seeing? Knowing that you were talking about uh, uh, the guy with the virtual reality uh, experience, I mean, my question there isn't so much technological as it is that these, these, this anomaly, these beings, whatever they are, obviously can affect human perception to such a huge degree for him to say they created this virtual reality for me and I could touch things, that doesn't mean he was touching anything mm-hmm. to me. That just means that was another experience. Um, you know, the, the idea of communication uh, from these things, I, I, I just I have the overwhelming sense that we're, we're misinterpreting the entire thing from the very get-go uh, because we just it's on such a different level from us that they are... I, I mean, if you really look hard at the bizarreness of the clues that are being thrown out uh, here and there, peppered throughout ufology in, in legitimate cases and legitimate scenarios, um, you're seeing something trying to communicate in a visual way. Uh, that's that that to me, looking at all this stuff is is not is saying not uh, hi, we're from here and we're trying to do this. It's more along the lines of we're not what you think we are. You need to get over this this illusion of little green men in a flying saucer. We're we're more than that. You've got to get past that. Did you ever they, think they, that they yeah. were aliens, Jeff? No. <laughs> so did you never think that they were aliens? Did you all did you always think that they were? Well, I know you've switched now, but did you always from the beginning think that they were demonic? I, I well, I never thought that they were demonic at the start. I didn't know what it was. It, it wasn't until much later on in the whole scope of the first ten or twelve years that I that I kind of arrived at that. Uh, um, so, starting from when, like, like, would you say that when you were a kid, you didn't know what they were, and then as you became an adult, you thought they were demonic? Would that be fair to say? Or? I mean, it would be fair to say that when I first, you know, uh, I would say when I was a kid, yeah, I, as a kid, I probably did think they were spacemen from someplace else, and I was fascinated by that. Um, but as things started happening and I started seeing things, of course, I never drew that line as a kid uh, in my experiences to anything to do with UFOs because the two never really coincided that much. Um, I didn't have that 
that pinnacle experience that said, this is, these are the people from inside UFOs. Um, in fact, I have only a small percentage of what I've experienced in my life even has any attribution to UFOs as far as craft in the air, that kind of thing. Most of it is just extremely bizarre uh, situations that, in the end, come around to being uh, you know, these small, smooth-skinned people. Um, that are clearly not human. So, you know, I, I don't know exactly uh, at what point did I say this is not spacemen. I, 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 I never had that in my head to begin with. I didn't know what it was. Um, so why do you think then, I mean, according, according to your thinking, mm -hmm. why do you think that they presented themselves as some sort of religious or evil or whatever? manifestation if you weren't even thinking that to begin with well i don't know that they presented themselves that way until i took notice of them uh in that direction what i did and how i kind of arrived at that that thought was to stop looking at the individual cases and the minutia of detail that i'd written down on all of these cases as i studied them um both public ones and ones that came to me uh, but I started to study the people, the effects on the people who encountered this stuff and what happened to them after, uh, you know, their, their commonalities as people. Uh, and all of that pointed towards a lot of suffering, a lot of uh, frustration, um, anguish, torment. Um, and then you start thinking a little bit about uh, uh, the, the similarities between uh, – uh, features on craft, you start thinking about, uh, at least in my case, and I know I've, I, I, I think I've mentioned the, the idea of the humps in the air before mm -hmm. um, when we were talking to Deb, but invariably, most times that I would see these figures kind of moving around in, in the air, um, they were in corners. And, uh, you know, there's an old saying, demons lurk in corners. Um, I never saw these things outside of a corner of a room. Uh, very, very rarely. Um, they, there just seemed to be all these things connecting together. Um, and, of course, the more I gravitated towards that, then that's then how I started to perceive them as these toxic, evil, inherently evil things. Uh, so, <laughs> again, going back to Dorothy Izot, who had positive experiences until someone said, you know, this is demonic, and then they took on that demonic form when she began to question it. You know, I had my demons, so I had the same thing. Uh, later on, when I gravitated towards looking at this from a DMT standpoint, I get fractals, you know, and I get this thing crawling out of a decidedly psychedelic pattern uh, in the hallway. So... <laughs> Again, are we creating the myth of what we expect to see based on what our attention is or what our, what our deep-seated questions are pointing to? Is that what we're going to get? And I think that, I, I, and again, I can't qualify this in any way whatsoever except to say I have the overwhelming feeling that every time we get to that spot, it's just another, nope, that's not it. That's not us. That's not what it is. And we're having a very hard time getting through your, your human perception to try to, you know, for you to experience us as we are. Mm -hmm. um, th that's always been this overwhelming feeling, like that's not it, but you're, you're heading in the right direction with a certain warmer, line of thought. Warmer, warmer, you know? cold, warmer. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um I said, Ben. I, let, let me let me just ask you really quickly. You you um, are you are you an experiencer? Um, that's complicated. <laughs> uh, it's I had a um, I had what what I have always said is a dream. Uh, but it was, and I'm sure you guys have heard a zillion stories very similar to this. <clears throat> While it was a dream, it had a quality to it, and I've always regarded it as a dream. It had a, a, a quality to it that was decisively undreamlike. Uh, the, the, you know, the interesting thing is actually, uh, Jeremy, is I remember, I remember listening to, and this has been a while back, I don't remember 
I, I listened to an interview with you, and uh, there were a lot of things that you had described that were that were somewhat to, to very similar to, to some of the stuff that was entailed in this particular dream. And there have been there have been other little events, nothing, you know, nothing ILM worthy, more uh, you know, sort of uh Xena and Hercules adventures special effects worthy, nothing nothing terribly exciting. Um but uh it it left me with the sensation that I could easily understand how that experience could be readily interpreted as the the sort of run of the mill um, abduction storyline, but it had a quality to it that that well again you know just exactly like you were saying Jeff it had a quality to it that was it, it was almost coy. Uh, almost as though there was something about the experience that was not exactly – in this case, it was pretty negative. Um, I, uh, I mean the, it's a bit long to, to go into in full detail, but, but in a nutshell, the, the end of the experience was the, the, the very negative part, which was uh, a sensation of being uh, blown down a tunnel uh, at, at like Mach 5. Uh, but it also was a, sort of like being sucked out of the back of my head. I, I, it, I was waking up at that point, or rather, I knew I was awake during the the dream, uh, which was I, I sort of got the impression why I was going through this sort of rushing motion, like I was being, you know, again sucked down a tube or or shot back a you know down a tube. Um, the, and the accompanying bit with that, and th- this, well, this may actually be interesting to the to the relevance of what we're talking about here. Um, what accompanied that was a feeling of of mindless, just beyond beyond imagination, sort of panic that I have, and I'm a writer, and I have yet to ever be satisfied with my description of it. Uh, it was it was a sort of panic that ever since I have tried to think of things that could make me this animal primal beyond fear sort of experience and i can't think of anything i mean it was it was and at the same time it was as though my my head my my mind during the experience was split in two one half of me was experiencing this like physical kind of panic the, this it was it was more of a physical experience almost i remember i felt as though i was i was I was inhaling very sharply and very quickly, almost like you know being plunged into water or something. Uh, and then at the same time, the, there was like another half of my mind that was actually a bit pissed off. Was was the only the closest I could get to the experience because I felt as though it wasn't real. There, there was a part of me that I, I felt as though it was like a switch had been flipped, and I wasn't panicked. But I, it was almost as though it was being inflicted upon me. Oh. Um, and like I said, it, it's it's I've tried to remain as as objective as anybody can with a uh, you know life changingly terrifying evening. Uh, <laughs> um, but it, so I, I don't really know. It, it's I've never I. I as far as experience, I can tell you that it was an experience in the sense that whatever it was, even if it was just a you know, a rather unusual biochemical feature of my brain that night. Uh, it was certainly an experience because it, it dramatically shifted something. Uh, my life you know, is I, a great basket. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, it was, there was certainly something rather profound that happened. I mean, for starters, I really didn't sleep for a couple of months. Uh, and to this day, I actually, I, I'm man enough to admit it. Uh, I, to this day, I hate sleeping in the dark. <laughs> Me um, too, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, and it's very hard to relate that to someone who, you know, because it does seem silly. I mean, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a big, scary guy. I shouldn't be really much afraid of anything, but, but at the same time, I mean, I, I will 
get that little feeling in the back of my neck, uh, like I'm a little girl, and just think, you know, <laughs> uh, I want a nightlight. I want my R2-D2 nightlight. Right. Um, <laughs> so as far as experience, you know, and that to me brings up one of the interesting questions about this, is that that uh, everyone talks about as an, you know, are, you know, is so-and-so an experiencer? Have you had an experience? What is the experience? Is the experience real or is it not? And to me, if you've had something that is this shocking, like I said, whether or not it's a biochemical response to something, whether or not you had a bit of bad potato, uh, whether or not you were, you know, captured and shipped off to, you know, Zebel Ganubi, whatever the case may be, whatever it is, it's an experience of some kind. And that is what bears scrutiny. Yeah, um, yeah to some extent, although the difference is, it would be that, that the potato then goes away. <laughs> and yeah, it will, has exactly. a lifetime of potato, which sucks. Sure, <laughs> sure. Well, what I mean is, well, of course, what I mean to say is that whatever it is, whatever it is, bears scrutiny. Um, and and that people, there, I think you have a lot of people that again they they buy so heavily into the nuts and bolts abduction that this is this is you know someone from Zeta Reticuli is coming here and they are stealing you out of the room. And of course, as we you know as we've talked about tonight, whatever it could be. Or whatever it is may be extremely bizarre, and it's trying to point us uh, at, at some sort of other meaning that we're simply not coping with, we're not understanding. But um, it, it's so for me, the idea of trying to find like a physical trace evidence or something is almost kind of beside the point right. if you've already got the experience, you know. Uh, I, to me, it's an unfortunate thing that a lot of science today discounts subjective human experience. Well, yeah. that, that, that seems – it, what's it, that? It, it, I was just going to say, as you say that, I mean, you know, it, it's so bizarre. I mean, you know, and what if it's the fact that it's trying to communicate with us? What if the message is, no, you don't get it. You're bizarre like me too. That's why we're here. Mm. <laughs> you know? And so then we have to see through our normalcy to become the bizarre thing. And do we want that? You know what I mean? Like I think that that's – it almost gets gets to the the, um, the the sort of Streber offer of, um, you, you know, you you can take this from us, you know, you can have I this, but you have to take too. it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know, but what I was gonna what I was gonna ask you is, I mean, you're you meditate as well, right? And do, do you mm-hmm. do you have um, any sort of relatable um, manifestations as a result of that, or even visions or anything like like that that sometimes you read about? Um, or is it completely I'm separate from anything? I'm trying to think how to answer. Well, I, you know, I don't think that, uh, I, I, I suppose you could say it's, it's, um, you know, any experience that we go through, whether or not we're a banker or, a, or, a you know, a Tai Chi master or whatever it may be, it's all a big tapestry anyway. And you never really know how your banking is influencing your, your dream experience or your uh, meditation experience or your experience with, you know, these sort of high weirdness incidents. So um, in that sense, I can say that it, it almost certainly has, but it probably has had an effect. And I have, I can think of, I can think of plenty of little moments where um, uh, you can't help but wonder if the sort of oddness that you're feeling at a, at a particular given time or in a particular given place is is not because you know you meditate, which meditation is sort of about watching yourself, and maybe that makes you a little bit more aware when when you know the hair on the back of your neck goes up or something like that it, again nothing i can't think of anything particularly dramatic that well the only other thing and i i i um and, and this was i don't even know i don't even know how to categorize this uh, again dream like but but interesting enough that i sort of took note of it was uh, the last time I was staying at my parents' house i've always had a difficult time staying at uh, my parents' new house um i i i had a moment where I, I I could have sworn I saw. You always hear about people talking about the shadow people, and being be, you know I'm an illustrator, I'm an artist. That's that's actually my day job, um, and I've always been curious. Whenever you hear these stories of people like the shadow people, and you know sometimes they wear a hat, sometimes they got a you know thing on their head, something like that. And I've always been curious, like what the hell does that look like? I, I talked to a few people, like. You know how did it have dimension? Did it have depth? You say it was made of shadow, and everyone would just say, "I don't know. It was made of shadow. I, I can't explain it." And um, the, and, and I I woke up at my parents, and uh, um, 
and the the only way I can remember it was that there was it was and Eric, I think I think I told I told you guys about this, didn't I? Yes. I but oh yeah, it's it, I may be describing it because I'm I've gotten some distance on it now. So let me know if I'm forgetting anything. Uh, but I did. I sort of woke up and there was a uh, like a damn figure standing like almost directly over the bed. Um, and it was I, the only way I could explain it when <laughs> when I was I was explaining it to like Eric and and uh, Violet Rage on the show was it looked like it was made of shadow. Now here's my problem with that is. What I'm wondering is if it wasn't some aspect of consciousness that that sort of went outside the bounds of of uh, what I understand is sort of uh, you know the visual cues of something being solid. It really did have a very dreamlike quality to it, even though I, I you know how you 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 sort of know I'm awake, and yet. It's still – there was this overlay of sort of a dreamy quality to it. That, that's the only other thing. And again, not a, not a particularly dramatic thing really for some reason. And you hear that all the time. You know, someone says there was a big you know, uh, flipping uh, something hovering over the, the, uh, the bedroom when I woke up. Well, why didn't you get out? Why didn't you run outside and look at it? I don't know. Yeah. You know, you hear that all the time. Um, it, it's it, – what I've been left with personally in my life is that that I, I believe that whatever the nature of of this experience, and I can't speak for everybody, but I've, I've become I've I've come to believe that whatever the nature of the experiences that I've had, you know, whatever that's going to be, it's really flipping weird, uh, and that's about as close as I can get to it. Like I mean, like uh, you know, it's sort of uh, one of the best descriptions I've heard of of how something can be paradigm changing is I suspect it will literally be that if I if I were to ever discover what the nature of, of this kind of experience is, I suspect it will be very much like living in a world all your life where the only color is red and then suddenly one day discovering blue. Yeah. I, I think it'll be that kind of a paradigm change. That that level of you know, holy crap, nothing in reality works the way I expect it does. And and of course, I don't know that. I mean, as I said before, just being intellectually honest, maybe it is a nuts and bolts thing, and it's just that level of technology, and the universe is just that weird. But um, but just based on my own, you know, limited experience, um, I, the the most I can commit myself to is it's just a very strange subjective experience that I just can't catalog. Yeah. Well, I, and to me. It, then the question that we're left with, sort of, like, again, I guess, is, um, you know, with the red and blue, is the blue something that is outside of us that we're looking at and now we're aware of, and oh my god, there's blue out there in the world? Or is the blue, since the red was, you know, us and everything, is the blue also a part of us and everything? And so, is this thing just some weird thing that's out there that wants us to know about it, or is it really saying, you are we, we are you, <laughs> I am the walrus? Uh, yeah. <laughs> coo 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 <-choo>. uh, <laughs> uh, My intuition is, and, and this is just my intuition, I can't really even intellectually commit to this, but this is my intuition. My intuition is that these things are in some very abstract yet very real way. Uh, pointing us to the paradox that's inherent in reality. It, it's it's pointing us to the reality of paradox. It, the the fact that paradox can exist. The fact that you can have both red and blue at the same time. Look at quantum physics. You you've got you know uh, you know you can have a spin both up and down. You can have two you know two charged particles that uh, or one charged particle that exists in two places at once, as far as what we can tell. And I, I believe maybe that what we're seeing here is the macro scale of that level of of sort of extant paradox in reality. That that this is something that it's maybe it, I think it can be both inside of us and very sort of objectively external. It's something that's that's telling us. I'll tell you one of the weirdest freaking ideas I've ever heard. Um, that really got me thinking was, and this is, dare I say, the second Terrence McKenna 
uh, of the evening. Um, <laughs> we're going to be drunk by the time we. <laughs> uh, but um, was was the notion that um, if you if you sort of approach. Uh, well, as you were saying before, you know the, these ancient cultures and some of the the very ancient kind of tribal rites and that sort of thing. Um, it, it has whatever this phenomena is has developed with us pretty clearly. It, it, it seems very clear. You know, you were saying you know you had fins in the fifties. Uh, today, you've got um, you know you've got all the the weirdness, the the profusion of bizarreness. Uh, that, that people are reporting, which which sort of goes with the world we're living in. We're, we're living in this world of accelerating ideas, accelerating imagination, accelerating um, experience. Uh, so if this, if whatever this is is growing with us, then it's I think what it's trying to tell us, or what it may be telling us, whether it means to or not, is that the external world and the internal world are not as disconnected as we think, which, of course, you know, a lot of religions have been saying that forever. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah, says you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I could tell you, I, I, don't, I don't think we're ever going to get the answer to this. Uh, but I think this, the, the, the struggle to try to understand it is part of it. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I was I was I emailed Eric today and I was telling him that I think to, to I think to know this for what it is would be giving away you know the the farm and I think that whatever is, I, I I mean my personal belief is that whatever the anomaly is. To to me, it's uh, I'm kind of categorizing it all in one big ball now because I don't think there is a they or a them anymore like I used to. Um, I just see it as an overall anomaly that we're living with that that is external, um, but can start internally just as easily as it can start externally. But I think this thing is at the same time trying to make us aware of something, but I don't think that it's. I don't think that it's going to give us the whole ball of wax because I think to do that would be um, giving away. I, I get the feeling there's a, there's a huge secret that we don't know and we can't know. Um, I think that knowing it all would be a huge problem, um, but I think it's doling out more information in very light doses in the way of these weird experiences that people do have. Um, just to make them aware of a greater reality is is kind of one point to it. There's a greater reality here that you know nothing about, but now you're going to learn. Uh, so that's out there. But at the same time, I think to know it all would be, you know, too much like getting the keys to the new car. I don't think we're at that level where we can know it all, if we ever will be. Uh, I think that the anomaly holds all the keys to all the answers as far as I'm concerned. Um, where we go after we die, what is consciousness, what is perception, all of these things. Uh, and again, you know, uh, take another drink or drop a tab, whatever you want. Um, you know, <laughs> but I, I keep going back to this, and, and to me it was one of the most interesting things I ever heard McKenna say was that when he asked one of these beings one time, you know, why do you, why do you make yourselves look like extraterrestrials? And they said, well, <laughs> if, if we let you know what we really were, you'd really freak out. So we pose as ETs. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think that speaks a great deal as to what the anomaly knows uh, or, or what it contains. Uh, and, and I don't think we'll ever get to the end of it. I think we can postulate all we want. I think it's going to be ten times beyond weird of what we think of as weird. Um, so I don't I don't know that we're ever going to get there because I think that to know that is to know everything is to know you know what the whole score is, and I don't think we're supposed to know that. I don't think we can know all of that. I don't think we can know all of that as we are now. I think it is no. as you know. <laughs> I think it's our charge to get to the state where we where we can and must know or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that all you know. I shouldn't even say must know because I I think it, it it's more symptomatic of having achieved whatever it is evolutionarily or 
uh, whatever, you know, individually, um, the state to where the knowledge can not fall on deaf ears. Um, but I, I think that that's, I mean, I don't think that they would bother with us if we weren't ultimately, quote unquote, supposed to get to a place where we can hear the whole thing. But then I, I, the caveat is I don't think we're recognizable as ourselves to ourselves anymore. I don't think we're what we would classically consider human at that point. I think we're something else. Mm-hmm. I think that uh, that also, if if there is some sort of super mind that's that's seeking to to kind of tweak our crank a little bit, um, then then almost certainly such a super mind is not going to be operating chiefly on our conscious level. What they're going to be wanting to get at is sort of under the hood. Uh, they're going to be working with our subconscious. Which is is uh, because you know after all you know we 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 deal with this stuff sort of intellectually and consciously, but the truth is that uh, human beings do not understand themselves at all. Uh, the the and you were asking as far as like meditation, one of the uh, the things that that you do figure out is you start and it never fails. Whenever you're teaching somebody to meditate, they never think they're doing it right, which generally means they are. Uh, and then they never think they're getting anywhere, which they, after a while, you realize is kind of the point. Um, and the one thing that you do sort of develop is you develop this healthy respect for the 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 unplumbed depths of of the human mind and and our own and not the mind. I, I got let me let me retract that. You you learn how complex emotionally we are. And that that's sort of where the game really is as far as an individual person. That the mind is just details and bank numbers and that sort of thing. But experience is all about emotion. Um, a neat little trick, anytime you're really trying to get something out of a dream or you're trying to remember your dream the next day, wake up and try to remember the emotion you were feeling rather than the details and you'll find the rest of it generally tends to follow. Mm -hmm. And that is what this experience is going to be working with. Uh, whatever this experience is, is working under the hood. Uh, what we may be seeing as so strange may be the bubbling up into the conscious mind of whatever more significant work they're doing that's that's a little deeper than that. Um, and, and, you know, as I said, it's it's you can't help but wonder if maybe uh, if, well, I don't know. It, it, it's it's as far as knowing the game, I don't think we'll ever get to know the game, but I suspect that whatever the game is is going to be something that has to be felt. Mm. It, it has it has to be perceived rather than than known. Mm. Um, well, I, I at least um, agree that that they're dealing under the hood, and I should throw this out for Zed on our message board and and whoever else his voice represents because I can hear him now going, "Can you guys please shut up about DMT and all this stuff and <laughs> let's talk about quantum reality here?" and and I think that um, I thought we were. Yeah, yeah. I think it's all. I think it is all just a description of the mechanism. It's like there's, you know, the way that they talk to us is through by through our biology. <laughs> the way they get to our biology is through the, uh, you know, particle wave duality. Uh, well, what what more what more sophisticated technology would you have besides developing a chemical base uh, chemical well, base DNA technology? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I just <laughs> I think that it all goes together. And um, but I'm not certain I agree with your take on emotions because I think that emotion and thought are the same. I mean, just as we oh, wrongly oh. divide the thinker from thought, I think we wrongly divide emotion from thought. I think that they are of the same. We'll, we'll definitely have to have a long talk yeah, about that. That'll be that'll be the next <laughs> the next hour. Yeah. On, I'll yeah. resurrect culture well, contact yeah. for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we have, should wrap it up, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my brain hurts. <laughs> this will be the longest Isa, episode we'll, ever. It's like three hour Paratopia. <laughs> Isa, what we've done is bring the noosphere wall. To Paratopia, <laughs> you hit that wall and it's all over. It's like an infection; it, it, it just spreads. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, guys. Uh, infection is mechanitis, maybe. <laughs> well, no, it's uh, certainly not an infection for us. Well, yeah, we're just gonna we're just gonna end this uh, and say our goodbyes and pretend that that the difference in Jeff's <laughs> voice from now to a second ago is uh, we, we don't know what happened. We 
couldn't possibly couldn't have been that the thing hung up on us again and and just computer crash. No, that didn't happen. No. Just ignore it. That's it's like replacing so Darren in Bewitch. Just ignore it and no one will know. It. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you guys jumped a shark with that paratopia. <laughs> so gentlemen, <laughs> thank you very much for for uh hanging out with us and uh talking shop and Eric, we will be seeing you in about a week. Yes, sir. Um and we will do a crossover episode. Is that correct? Anything you want to do, I'm up for it. Oh, awesome! And um, and a, and a YouTube video to boot. Yay! Yay. Look at all the fun we're gonna have. <laughs> all right. Looking for ISO Ben. We will never see you. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> but I had a good time tonight. Oh, excellent! And Jeff, we see way too much of you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm out. Jeff, any final words? Uh, yeah, actually, I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to get into my email, uh, because we have to mention that we have, um, a little raffle thing coming up this week, um, for the benefit of Ted Phillips and the, uh, Center for Trace Research. And, uh, my computer is freaking out, so we may have to, uh, record this later. All right. God damn it. <laughs> uh, well, and, and essentially, what happened was you you were going to create something um, to to raffle off, but then other artists came to your aid, and you got lazy and said, "You know what, guys, why don't you just go do it?" <laughs> you bastard! Oh, I'm sorry. No, uh, well, we'll we'll deal with this later. No, I, I'm still going to be doing something, but uh, uh, in, in the interim, we had. Uh, a great guy whose artwork was on display at the last X conference, and it was uh, uh, really gorgeous prints. And he's offered three prints to one lucky winner. And uh, I'm sure if you go to the homepage, you'll read all about him. And uh, I'm sure that we'll uh, we'll have his name up there, so we actually uh, we get to know who he is. Uh, <laughs> as soon as we find out who he is, yeah, well, we'll find out who he is. My computer's crashed yet again while we're speaking. Ah, it's been one of those weeks, Jeremy, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm getting a new computer. Rob Simone of podcasting has yeah. had a bad week. Yes. <laughs> uh, all right. I'm calling it quits. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Thanks again, guys. <laughs> Thank you. And if you'd like to know more about Newosphere, all you have to do is listen to the ad that is going on right exactly now. Greetings. You are about to enter the newosphere. A roundtable stream of consciousness podcast on subjects related to and inspired by the paranormal, metaphysics, and science. Join us for our broadcasts or visit our website at www. Newospherepodcast.com, where you can download past episodes and join in our discussion forums. We will break your mind. And the artist who is kindly going to donate three of his pieces, his name is Mark Brabant, or Brabant, or Brabant, it's B-R-A-B-A-N-T. Brabant sounds artistic, so let's call him Mark Brabant. Um, in any event, you can look at his artwork at www.hoveringobject.com. That's all one word, hovering object. And the three pieces that he is donating to our raffle are, or prints thereof, are Lifted, that's one, Retriever, that's another, and It Never Made a Sound, that's the third one. Uh, so, check them out. Check out the new Osphere. Liberate your mind! I don't know, I just needed something to end this with. 